Welcome to the 125th edition of Kielabaka. Uh, my name is Andy Rice, and joining me is 49er class manager Ben Ramoka. So uh, welcome, Ben, and couldn't have anyone better for today because what we've got lined up for you is the first day of racing at Kielabaka for the 49er fleet, and we've got an enormous fleet. It's broken in into three flights for qualifying. So, Ben, just talk us through the format. Yeah, we've got five days of racing, so the first two days will be qualifying, like Andy said, because there's such a large fleet here where it's broken into three for the 49er. Uh, then it'll be followed by two days of gold fleet racing and then a medal race on the final day. So what we're bringing you today is the yellow fleet from the uh, qualifying of 49er right now. Okay, and... The weather is just unbelievable. This is the 125th edition of Kiela Vodka, but it's never been so hot, has it? They're calling it California. It's 30 degrees, legit 30 degrees. Uh, I've been swimming so often because there's no air conditioning here, jumping literally into the Baltic, which is, you know, if most people have been to Kiela Week, they know uh, how cold it is normally. So the sailors have just started. Off you go, Andy. Okay, so the, the race one has just begun, and uh, launching off the pin end is James Peters and Finn Sterrett in GBR5, with uh, Tim Fischer and Fabian Graf in Germany 3, third in the World Championships last year, and look how fully stretched James Peters is there. Finn Sterrett just leaning in to adjust some of the controls, getting the boat fully up to speed for full power upwind conditions. Peters and Sterrett talking about their options, but at the moment their options will be fairly limited because they won't have stretched enough distance on anybody else yet to be able to attack. But what a fantastic start yeah, for they've, GBR5. They've won the pin end, and uh, now they'll be looking to extend. I mean, they'll have wanted to get out in clear air in this kind of wind condition. If you've got the low, the low option to keep your speed up all the time, it's a really powerful tool. And they've won the pin. They're recently, uh, as of the most recent rankings, number one in the world, and they're showing it to start the regatta, which they'll be thrilled. Um, yeah, they, uh, they are number one in the world. They, they, did, they didn't sound too bothered about being number one. I think that's, that's something to be quite proud of, but they're certainly <laughs> justifying uh, that number one world status right now with the start that they've just pulled off. Yeah, just they're, they're already putting Fabian Graf uh, under pressure there. He's just slipped back a little bit, uh, still hanging on to his lane there. So they've got a little bit of work to do to force out the Germans so that they can tack and cross. But it uh, looks like they're at least part of the way there to affecting the Germans' thought process. You could just see them. Oh, they've already tacked out. So that's one of the two jobs done. They've got their teammates, uh, GBR284, on their hip. So only one more, uh, two, three, four, that's James Grumman and Daniel Budgen, I think, uh, they've tacked as well. So take that, the pin end start, they've got both people off their hip and now they have full control of what they want to do uh, and probably in a commanding position. Great start from Peters and Starrett. Just going into attack there, look at the speed of movement through that attack, the crew straight out on the trapeze on the handle and the helmsman not far off. But they're going to have to duck Belgium 24, that's an Estonian boat, Estonia 321. Um, and uh, really beautiful tack. It just goes to show, Ben, um, I, I can't tell you at the moment, we'll get up to speed with who Estonia 321 is, maybe you know, but uh, um, you know, e even the middle of the fleeters, just their boat handling is just phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, Juso Ruho and Henry Ruho, they're a newer combination. Juso's been sailing with a different uh, crew for a while and now teamed up with his brother. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're trying to get one of the final qualification spots from Estonia. You can just see uh, that was Belgium, now the farthest left boat. They tacked, that's, uh, and you can back with the leaders. So we've got the, the leaders from the left, Peters and Starrett. Doesn't seem, uh, or at least it looks right now with the virtual, that on the far side is McCarty and McKenzie, who are uh, the number one team. And actually, they've got an extra boat there now, which uh, Lamaru and Van... We'll have to see who we're sailing with. The Dutch are always changing who they're sailing with, so it's always a tricky to know uh, the combinations. But uh, it looks like the far right pack is the ones that have the lead of the race right now, uh, which Peters and Starrett won't be thrilled with, but it still uh, looks pretty even given how close the lines are. We do sometimes see from this wind direction that the right side is a little more powerful than the left. Um, at least we were here for the 2017 European Championships. Um, uh, so two years ago, and, and we saw in this course that the right side could be the more favored side. Uh, it's an offshore wind, so typically the sides don't matter too much, but they do get a little bit of a funneling effect, or so it is thought. So it, we might expect that right side to be the, the winning side, and it's showing on the virtual to be that way so far. 
Yes, yeah, so uh, you look at the TV picture, and, and I think uh, GBR5 looks fantastic in that position right now. But according to the tracking, all the action is taking place on the far side of the track with a couple of Kiwis uh, quite, uh, quite up there at the moment. McCarty and McKenzie, the best of the Kiwis. There's an awful lot of Kiwis here. In, in, I think there are six teams overall, including, of course, Pete Burling and Blair Chute, the reigning Olympic champions. Uh, but at the other end of the scale, there's a, there's a couple of 17-year-olds doing the first um, uh, international regatta. Yeah, Aaron... the, the, we're doing our Worlds in New Zealand later in the year, and that's got New Zealand all fired up. There's something like 10 development teams who have all come in from 29 or recently to get their taste of World Championship action when the fleet joins them later in the year. And uh, the New Zealand uh, Yachting Federation has seen to it to bring their, their top performers and some of the developing sailors all the way up to Kiel to get a little bit of extra racing. So we're just about to find out it does look to me like that far side's going to cross, but I think we see Leo Takahashi in the Japanese flag uh, coming across right now. So Peters and Starrett will be down in the in the mid pack or, or mid, mid to upper pack, but uh, but that right side has come across so far, and um, and that pin start wasn't the way to go. You can win your side, but you can't guarantee your side your side will pan out. So it does make you wonder how much homework they did before the start, and and how obvious this right hand side is is a feature of the course, or is it is it just shifting? We'll we'll have to wait and see as as the day develops. But Ben, you, you were hinting that if you were out there, then you probably would have liked to have taken the right well, hand Well, it's always easy in hindsight, that's for sure. Well, you were, you, well, you were talking about the hindsight of previous years, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll see if it happen, if it remains to be the, the favorite side through the day. But I do remember uh, from the 2017 event that the, the guys were heading right and doing well with it. We see Matheson and Matheson, uh, Norwegian, young Norwegian team, uh, currently got the lead and, and just on their hip was Button and Mara also on the ley line. Uh, so we'll start to see those. That's McCarty and McKenzie, New Zealand 18, I believe. That's right. Uh, it is McCarty and McKenzie, one of the young up and coming teams and did very well at the World Cup in Genoa um, earlier in the year, back in back in April. Certainly able to, to show the uh, the senior teams a thing or two. And now we're coming in to the business end of the Wimbledon mark. It looks like McCarty and McKenzie are going to be going first round yeah, you can see how high they were pointing compared to some of the teams that overstood, like Mara. So they're rounding side by side, Matheson, uh, with McCarty McKenzie. Let's see, they go for the jibe set. Yeah, of course, so they believe the, that side is, is actually important. Uh, get that jibe set in, so they're heading back towards what they think is the best win. So are the poles. Was that 19 or 119? Oh, that was a, that was a, a bit uh, of a problem on the jibe for the second boat round. It looked like Matisse and Matisse and were having a bit of problem on the rounding. I wonder if they've kept the boat upright. No, they've laid it over. So That was actually, I think that was Buxak and uh, Wyszbitski, who are, they should be able to pull off a jibe set. Those are two class sailors, uh, but just didn't get it right there, and at a critical moment too, third place round and in the drink. Wow. I mean, it's not that windy. It's quite surprising two such experienced sailors from Poland uh, made that kind of mistake just then. Yeah. And for all Fat oh. Fisher and Graf, they hook up the Wimbledon mark. They're going to have to take a turn on that. And now they've got to find the space to do that turn. Oh, my they goodness. And there's, there's Peters and Sterrett. We just see the, them come in. So they've almost come uh, you know, back two-thirds of the, of the fleet here. You can see how powerful that right side must have been for the guys who won the pin and, and, got, and pinched out everyone with that speed to be so far back. We've got a lot of jibe setters. We've got a lot of people struggling with their jibe sets, so maybe we're not giving uh, giving the fleet quite as much credit for how much wind it is. But uh, you, you can see uh, Finn, uh, Starrett, and James Peters already trying to navigate through some traffic. I think they just had to jibe again for... Um, well, considering how great and, their start was, it really isn't a great... I mean, they're only about five or six from the back. Yeah. So uh, we, let's get a replay and, and just uh, see some of that action back again and then we'll come back to the to the live action in a moment that's uh, the wood brothers can 226 uh, young team from canada trailing the fleet and uh, looking to get back into things um, okay yeah, so this sorry. is the uh, hooking of the mark by graf and yeah, so they, that was just when they hit the mark. Then they try and do their they do their turns. That's Finn Starrett and James Peters uh, getting out of their way. They, they're going to go into their 360 here. And actually, they, they fouled uh, uh, another boat by being in their way in the middle of that, too. So quite a mess for them. And now we get back to the front of the pack. So McCarty and McKenzie, the young Kiwis, maintaining a 70-meter lead over the Matisse brothers from Norway. 
And interesting to see Will and Sam Phillips, the Australian brothers. A lot of, lot of uh, siblings out here, aren't there? Um, the, the Phillips showing a fantastic performance at the European Championships for the 49er in Weymouth recently. And uh, you, you start to wonder if the Phillips brothers are pu putting themselves in a position to be selected for the Games at Tokyo 2020 next year. They've been in the class a long, long time, but they really seem to be coming on form now, quite late on in their careers. Yeah, the Will, Will Phillips and Sam, sailing with his brother Sam who was injured last year. They're putting a lot of pressure on that young Matisse and uh, pair right now because they're just to leeward of them and holding them out. All this group has to jibe and uh, the Phillips brothers will be looking to go to that far ley line and push the Mathesons past, past them. And oh, we're just panning back in the fleet. Peters and Sterrett on the left-hand side. We followed their, their fantastic start out of the line. It did them absolutely no, no good whatsoever. It was the wrong side of the course. McCarty and McKenzie still leading by a comfortable margin. They hit that ley line. That'll get them a ton of extra of, of meters there, having uh, one less jibe to do. And you can see uh, the Dutch there in second place, Hootman. Uh, gets his jibe in, and then it'll be a, a big mess as everyone else comes in around. But uh, Will and Sam Phillips, I like that positioning. They're going to head cleanly out to the right, where we've seen uh, was so powerful in that first upwind, followed by Boten and Mara. So two top teams there heading right with McCarty and McKenzie uh, looking to just get clear, and I assume they'll head back right since it was, there we go. Well, so there, there you go, Ben. But, I mean, they've got to sail back through potentially a bit of bad air from the boat still coming down wind. I'm sort of quite surprised they had the choice of both marks. Why did they decide to go around that one, I wonder? Yeah, I think when they got the ley line right from such a distance, they decided just to reduce their maneuvers. And they do have a, a fair lead, so it's a good covering position they're in. Uh, but they probably have given up a little bit of leverage, but they'll also get a chance to, uh, when those Phillips brothers tack back, they'll get a chance to judge the ley line from them and, and make a decision. So they're in a, still in a very good position, uh, possibly not the optimum way around the course, but uh, maybe tactically gives them a little more comfort to see their closest competitors underneath the boom there, and they can just sail fast and not have to think too much, not have to look over their shoulders for the rest of this beat. Well, you, you see this kind of performance from a, a young Kiwi crew that we haven't heard much about, and, and then you realize that Pete Burling and Blair Duke, just to win the New Zealand selections, is not going to be a walk in the park. I mean, the Olympic champions, it's very unlikely that anyone other than them will be selected to go to T Tokyo 2020, but there's plenty, plenty of good Kiwis breathing down their necks. Yeah. Um, yeah, th there's a very strong Kiwi team. I think it is a selection panel there, and... Uh, you know, it'd be tough on the selectors to uh, to not select the best team in the world, but um, or the best sailors in the world, I should say. But uh, you know, you can tell by the fact that Burling and Tuke are here how seriously they're taking their campaign, uh, because I reckon if the fleet, if the world wasn't so close to them, uh, they might not be doing quite so many events. But they've had a very full spring right now. They've done uh, almost all the regattas. So we, well, and McCarty and McKenzie have tacked back, so they are actually going up the middle of the fleet. They might be playing some shifts uh, in the middle. It is an offshore breeze, so there will be puffs and shifts but I'm surprised to see unless the Phillips the Phillips maybe have come back as well so p playing the middle but, of the course a bit, a bit surprising uh, meanwhile uh, Houtman uh, the the Dutch team Ned 491 doing very well over the, this side of the course so actually maybe some gains to be made back on the left hand side which didn't work out so well for James Peters and Finn Sterrett on the uh, the first beat but so maybe things are a little bit more complicated than just going right on this course yeah, we'll find out pretty soon. But we remember on the, with the tracking, we did see that that angle showed uh, showed Peters tied, and, and actually the guys were way ahead. So that that gain line might not be so equal. But obviously McKenzie and McCarty felt that uh, Hootman was doing okay here on the far left upwind, and uh, and decided to do a bit of covering. So Hootman and Ned four nine one plowing a lonely path out to the left hand side. Um, but then it looks like the boat's further up. That probably is McCarty and McKenzie uh, in the middle of the picture up the top um, as Hootman tacks over onto port. It looks like McCarty and McKenzie still with a reasonable lead. Yeah, you can see a bit of light. It's a bit light there as uh, Hootman has come back and uh, had a bit of a dip, and I think that was a header as well. So probably not the op optimal way uh, of time to come back, actually. We can see on the virtual that he's dropped a bunch of meters just in right after he tacked. So unfortunately, it seems like he's tacked back to the center of the course on a header. Um, and, you know, when you're so far to the left, you, you often run out of choices. So uh, could be the McCarty and McKenzie are uh, 
are just picking up the good shifts up the middle, and, and obviously if Hootman's been on a header, then McCarty and McKenzie are on a lift being on opposite tacks, and a very comfortable lead now for McCarty and McKenzie. But the Phillips brothers, who did round the far side, uh, that was clearly the best choice, as they've uh, passed a number, or Hootman who, and Matheson, who came to the left mark, and uh, but there's a couple boats getting, getting leverage farther right now. Uh, Lambrio and the young uh, Austrians, Pretner. And you look at that shot there, and, and behind the Norwegian sail, you can just see the Phillips brothers creeping out into the middle of the picture, and it looks like a pretty healthy lead, and they've got more breeze up there as well. So it does look like the right-hand side, exactly as you had said, Ben, looks to be the safest place to be. And they yeah. look higher and faster up there. I, th I think Hootman is, is in trouble down here. He's going to lose places on one of the other Australian boats. Yeah, he's taken an awful lot of leverage to the left, uh, the side that didn't pay on the first beat, and then he couldn't find a shift to come back on. Didn't want to duck another boat, so he tacked farther left, and, and hopefully he gets a better shift on the way by. But as we see, we see Heinzman and Barnes, a uh, new combination, but a veteran Canadian crew. Uh, they've played it simple, just gone to the right, and uh, with their speed, uh, they've, they've managed to pass a bunch of boats here to a very credible third place so far in the first beat. Um, you see Iago Mara and Diego, and Diego Botten, uh, at Spain 97 through Hootman Sales, they had a very good rounding uh, and went to the side that we saw the Phil Brothers do well yeah. on, and, and they've dropped back. And actually, we see Peters and Starrett in the far side there. You see how far leveraged they are. So they haven't uh, made the mistake of going left again, uh, and we'll see. We'll be able to see if that pays off for them going so far right. Yeah, leaving themselves very few tactical options, but it, it does look like there's a line of breeze up on the far right-hand side that maybe doesn't flow down across the rest of the course. So that could be a good gamble by Peters and Starrett and the other boats on the far right. So this here we are with leaders. the leaders. Looking very good right there. You see uh, how low they were in their trapezes, perfectly flat. Look very comfortable, like their settings are working for them. Main, uh, main at just about the right spot for going fast uh, without too much drag. I think we're on board with them here. And sailing bare-armed at Keel Week. I mean, <laughs> California, it really is a fantastic week or day of racing today. Probably one of the best you could ever hope for. Yeah, hot and, hot and uh, sunny with some offshore winds, so a few shifts. I mean, it's perfect with this breeze strength. Um, and there's very few of the top class teams not here. I mean, this is almost a world championship in terms of the standard that we're watching. Yeah. Okay, we're only watching one third of the fleet. So meanwhile, uh, the red and the blue divisions are racing, and that includes uh, some of the big stars like Pete Burling and Blair Chuk elsewhere on the other race courses. But later on the, this week, we'll see the best, the cream of the crop, rising to the top and racing in the gold fleet. Yeah, the only the only team in the top 50 I can think of that isn't here right now are Fletcher and uh, Bithel, who were busy uh, it, with their commitments to the CLGP, but the rest of the fleet came in force, and, and it's going to make for a fantastic regatta. McCarty and McKenzie now on lay line, uh, still in the lead, but the lead has narrowed a little bit, um, but they're coming in. I would expect another jibe set here, uh, and and if they can perform their boat handling properly that I reckon they've got the they've got this win but the Phillips brothers might have a little bit to say about it they've taken a good uh, chunk of meters off them as we thought they might from that uh, mark rounding and and McCarty and McKenzie their track isn't showing them making the mark so they might be giving away some more meters here surely they haven't made the mistake I mean sometimes the tracker doesn't get everything wrong are they gonna have to do another tack they have already so that they did two more tacks at the end and uh, and now we've got a boat race here with the uh, Phillips brothers chasing McCarty and McKenzie hard into this final windward mark and there's gonna, there's a choice to be made it's obviously not clearly one-sided so they've got to do a jive set and I wonder if we'll see the Phillips brothers do the opposite well it, it seems to me Ben um, that the, there is so much going on on the right hand side here you, you really don't want to risk being too far off off that side the inshore side of the course the left of our screen right now so McCarty and McKenzie did do a jibe set and the and the Phillips brothers have as well so they could be just picking up the final shift to the mark but here's those Canadians Heinzman and Barnes uh, in third round the windward mark Fisher Graf in fourth now how impressive is Fisher and Graf going round in fourth bearing in mind they hit the mark first time round they took that penalty turn and they're back up into fourth place that's true that was they were they dropped about half the fleet in that circle they did so that's very impressive Hootman rescued himself pretty well there round in six so what looked like a bit of a disaster he's he's done well that's Grummet from Britain seeing some unusual names up here aren't we well it's qualifying so you're gonna get a bunch more people but also the 49er fleet's very deep right now Ooh, inside jibe set that's those Matheson brothers just uh, also, had the another Matheson's have dropped a long way back then I mean they were, they were still in what second or third place going and around there's the... Botton and, Lo and Lopez as we just panned down Botton and Lopez were 
right beside the Phillips brothers as they rounded the leeward marks, and they've wow. dropped all the way down. Yeah. So it's a very tricky race course here, and uh, we're seeing lots of opportunities for passes and for mishaps. That was that Fisher and Schmidt, Groff, uh, is uh, Fisher, it? No, we saw them pass. That might have been have to catch what the other German team was. Look at the lead there from McCarty McKenzie. So it is a match race, as you said. It's, it's an Antipodean match race. The Kiwis just 46 metres ahead of the Australian brothers, the Phillips. So the Phillips, very good in strong winds, very confident in their boat handling. Will they be able to put pressure? Well, they're already putting pressure on McCarty and McKenzie. Will McCarty and McKenzie have the bottle, the metal, to be able to hold on to this race lead that they've had for so long in this race? Coming down towards the finish. Final jive there. So, uh, so far, Phillips brothers haven't found any opportunities to take much leverage, but we'll see if they separate a little bit here. Uh, McCarty and McKenzie should have got their ley line pretty close. So there, there won't be too much to get, but look, they're locked in. Flying downwind. I mean, it's pretty flat water here, but as the bottom of the course comes, there'll be a tiny bit more chop. This is fantastic racing here. Uh, and McCarty and McKenzie, you know, they'll be thrilled to start the regatta this way. It's always, uh, you know, qualification isn't where these top sailors... Uh, Look to win regattas. Oh, oh, what's going on with Phillips the Phillips? Brothers, uh, they're, they're, uh, must have lost their halyard in the in the jive there for uh, some reason. Or, or maybe. I mean, the, the kite looked like it had a bit of a wrap in it as well. I wonder if they actually had to release a bit of halyard to, to get a, an hourglass out or something. I'm not sure, but um, th they've lost a lot of distance there. So surely no one can take the race win off McCarty and McKenzie now. But you look at the Phillips now. <laughs> look okay. how lit up they are. They they're are on a, a totally different, different angle. angle. I wonder if we'll have found they've overstood here because McCarty and McKenzie weren't far off ley line when they jibed, but they're, they're 20 degrees different here, and it looked like the Phillips brothers were well lit up, and we can see in the uh, 3D they're taking a ton of meters out there, so the Phillips brothers have taken a little bit of leverage, and if they're not outside of the ley lines, they might be able to capitalize and, and uh, take the win here. Wow, so it's, it's really closing down. The Phillips brothers just in a very, very lucky gust right now, if they can hang on. But you can see the way the boat's leaning over slightly. They don't want to be going any lower than they are. They're pushing up as high as they can, so they must have overstood the ley line. Now the question for the Australians is, can they hold on to that Red Jenica? Because they wish that Red Jenica was half the size it is right now. But McCarty and McKenzie, they've jived back, and Phillips on starboard. Can they hold on? to get across the finish line. It looks like they can. So the Phillips brothers ragging their kite across the finish. All that 18 foot skiff experience the Aussies have comes in useful as they cross the line for the win. Australia 66 takes it just ahead of McCarty and McKenzie who led for 99% of that race. But when What a mistake most... they made there, driving early and letting uh, the Phillips brothers have an opportunity. I mean, they weren't even close to ley line. It's very tricky in the skiffs with the uh, with the pressure changes uh, dictating so much about the angles, but what a mistake. And we see Heinzman and Barnes come in for the third just place finish just ahead of, I think that's the Dutch. It is the Dutch. Hoopman coming back very well on that run, followed by the Germans uh, Fischer and Graf, who I think rounded in third or fourth, so they dropped a, a little bit. And look how light it is now compared with when the Phillips brothers were winning that race just less than a minute ago. So really pulsing on the course there. And firing across in quick succession. Actually, I've just seen Hoopman go across. So who was that who crossed in third? That's Bart Lambrio. Wow, so we so saw where did they come from? They were extremely leveraged to the right side halfway up the beat, and it, they, they managed to pass. That makes more sense because we saw how much trouble Hoopman was in. Uh, Peterson Sterrett, very good final run for them. So they, they managed to pull some kind of finish out of an awful race for them. Takahashi crossing, that's followed by... One of the other Kiwi boats, NZL 900. That's Samuel Bacon and Henry Gautry, the 17-year-olds. Oh, Lefebvre and... Uh, Where are the Spanish? Have we seen the Spanish cross yet? Yeah. No, the Spanish that's are that's just crossing in now. now. Wow. So that's what a mixed-up Spanish... race. Yeah. So lots of opportunities, upwind and downwind. And now we see some of the back markers in. There's the Estonians we talked about earlier. And no book Sack and Vizbitsky. That's I mean, painful from that capsized whoa, rounded third to third. Start. Yeah, yeah, capsized on the on the jive set. And, and then, we're just bringing up the rear. We've only got about three boats left to cross. This is Engstrom and Westberg from Sweden. And then it's dribs and drabs. We've got a Canadian, a Finnish, and a Swiss boat still to cross the finish line. So uh, I reckon, you know, a lot of these guys have been playing shifts and looking for puffs here and there in the course, but I reckon it's a waste of time. We've seen those boats from the far right side dominate and make big gains almost in every leg. So so maybe you can switch your brain off and just go right upwind, but I think there's more to it downwind, isn't there? It's not just a jibe set, is it? 
Well, if we look at it, I mean, the way the, the way the Phillips brothers passed was on that same side. So here's confirmation of the lead of the winning positions and how they got there. 21-minute race for the Phillips brothers. And look at those uh, top speeds. 21.12 knots from McCarty and McKenzie. I mean, those are high speeds for a 49er. I'm surprised to see the Phillips uh, on that last run. It looked like they might have taken a an higher speed, but actually they were probably gaining mostly in the angle and, and a little bit optimum with that heel over. But uh, it's very above 20 knots and racing is very good. Flat water. Uh, Heinzman and Barnes, I mean, it'd be interesting to show them these stats. Fastest boat through the water, um, but also furthest distance. So, so maybe you didn't pick the uh, the most economical course around the racetrack, but Heinzman and Barnes showing the greatest speed through the water. Maybe they're just not pulling the sails in hard enough. Well, uh, the skipper Heinzman, he's a laser sailor and uh, still weighs in at roughly laser weight, so he's a big boy and they're, they're enjoying the flat water and, and big wind conditions. He's, uh, they reckon they're pretty fast in this stuff. Uh, they're tasked with uh, the Canadian... Uh, place in the Pan Am Games coming up, so they're Canada. It's Canada versus USA, basically, to decide one of the Olympic berths coming up. So they'll be happy with a third place finish. Uh, this two have been studying actually, so haven't been sailing as much as you might expect. But uh, but nevertheless, a good showing from them, and in the right conditions, they've obviously got what it takes. Very impressive third place for them, and and ahead of some really world class competition. The world number ones we saw coming off that start line, absolutely winning the pin did them absolutely no good whatsoever. James Peters and Finn Sterrett getting, getting the start they wanted, but taking them to the wrong side of the course. So the question now in the next race is how hard are people going to be fighting for the committee boat end of the line, for the right-hand side of the line, in order to be able to get out to the right-hand side quickly. One of the other things, especially in this kind of breeze, to look out for is 49ers starting on port tack, maybe letting the starboard tackers go ahead of them, but then you, you sail out the back of them. Yes, you take a bit of bad air, but not much, but it immediately launches you to the right-hand side of the course, which at the moment seems to be the correct side of the course as well. That port tack option start can be very powerful. It's uh, it's fantastic in the skiffs where you're up to speed so quickly and you don't you save yourself the distance of attack immediately as soon as you duck. You can get in trouble if too many people are doing it and, and you can't bear away and, and there can be some collisions if people don't give enough room. But if you stay clean and clear, it's a very powerful way to get clear air and be going the direction you want. Uh, and you punch up that boat length, you lose uh, very quickly. Yeah. And... Um we always see windward lures in 49er racing, but as we saw with the Phillips, they, they had to show their tight reaching skills to be able to win that race. I sometimes wonder, Ben, you're the class manager. You can change things with a wave of your magic wand. I, I would like to see some reaching in some of these races because you see how on the edge of control these boats are. These are the best in the world. We should be testing them on the, the most difficult points of sail, surely. There, there was a time in 49er sailing where literally it was assumed you could not beam reach. And uh, the, the guys zone. are the death zone. And now, you know, up until almost the very reaches of our limits, uh, the sailors can handle it now, be it two sails or three. The skills are so high and the settings and, and obviously the mass and whatnot have improved as well. There, there are very few then. angles you can't handle anymore. Well, throw, um, throw it at them, Ben. <laughs> well, you know, sailing's gotten very windward lured uh, uh, dominant these days, and, and its uh, reaching legs were considered boring back in the triangle days, and, and these windward lures were considered free, and you can do what you want. And, you know, we did see that this race. I mean, uh, a procession across a reach wouldn't have been nearly as exciting and, and had as many it, place it, changes as what we saw this time, but we should probably try a few more things than well, just windward lures. If it's a procession, there's absolutely no point in doing it. The only point in having a leg on a race course is if there's a potential for place changing. I totally agree with you on that. I just think in windy conditions, sailing down the death zone is a real skill, and some are better than others, and there will be passing. Reaching starts? Maybe that would be an exciting way to do it. We've seen it in the catamaran classes. Obviously, we deadly boring in uh, in under planing conditions. Yeah. But you know, from eight knots on, it'd be pretty interesting. And, I think uh, so. I think the race officers would want some technological help uh, to have a, a fleet of the size we would ever want to race doing a reaching start. I think it's quite difficult for them to judge the line with the speeds uh, uh, that the teams would be crossing on a reach. But other than that, you know, it could be pretty spectacular. You set it at 150, 200 meters, sort of. 30 to 45 seconds worth of racing and you know it could be pretty exciting well you do, uh, you being from canada you probably know how they start an ice yachting race you, you know how they do that <laughs> le mans style right with a run and a push and they, jump in they do that's not the bit i was referring to but um the, half the fleet is given a ticket to go right out of the start on one tack and the, the other half is given a ticket to go left so you go on diverging courses out, out of the start 
I just wonder if you could have some kind of thing like that, so you don't have immediate clashes off the start, but you just get everyone launching out the start. At what high problem? Speed. I'm not sure what problem we're trying to solve at this point. <laughs> oh, I, I just want to mix it up a bit. Ah, there we go. I just want yeah. to mix it up a bit. I'm I'm all for experimentation and just trying new things, but it all comes back. What what inspired me to talk about it is seeing the Phillips ragging into that finish line, and a, a lesser crew may not have been able to hold on to the Jenica there. Well, you could see how lit up they were on that last run into the finish. They uh, they had, you know, they, they weren't quite dropping the main completely. There is a point at which the skipper will just drop the main and hope the mast doesn't break, which is pretty safe these days, uh, and they'll just take it all the way in. Uh, but they didn't have to do that. They were, you know, uh, the brother Sam was curling the, the front of it a little bit and they had a, a couple snaps, but... Um, it's a bit of a flatter kite, isn't it, than um, before as well. There's been a, a, a bit of a, a reshaping, which I would think uh, the Phillips brothers were quite grateful for that, just blasting into that finish right there. It would have been a bit harder with the old Jenica, which was a little bit fuller. Yeah, we changed the shape of the, they updated the shape of the spinnaker after the Rio Olympics to a more modern shape, more like what the FX looked like. The guys were a little bit unhappy with uh, the girls going faster, or the FX going faster than them downwind in the big wind conditions, and, and it has proven to be a lot more forgiving in the big wind conditions conditions, it's flatter, uh, a, a more clean profile, especially in the windier uh, end of the scale. So uh, yeah, they would have liked that, and, and you do have, or the theory was actually you'd have more lanes with this kite downwind. And um, um, So um, I just need to confirm, but I think we might be taking a short break uh, before the next start, but that next start is not very far away. The wind conditions are amazing, as you've just seen. Um, so don't go too far away. Make yourself a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and join us back for race two very shortly.
start of the second race for the yellow group. Uh, remember, it's three uh, qualification groups in the early stages of Kiel Week for the 49er fleet. There's, there's more than 80 boats competing. Remind me, Ben, how many do we have total? 95. 95. Yeah, 95. Very big fleets here. So, um, so we've got the, just the one course, obviously, that we're able to show at a time. But we can report to you that from the other courses, uh, it was Dunningbeck and Gunn who took a bullet along with Fisher from, Pecan. From where are they? Which countries are we talking? Yeah, Dunningbeck and Gunn uh, are a Kiwi team that are really pushing, uh, pushing Burling and Tucard for that qualification spot. They've had a couple top tens this season. Uh, we're a minute 47 away from the start, and you can see the wind has increased as it's forecast two right now. It's meant to build all the way up to 19 knots today uh, in about an hour from now. So that looks to me about uh, over 15. And uh, with 135 to go, we'll see if we see some teams. We do see some teams, rather, setting up for that port tack option start we talked about. These teams that are outside beyond closer to us uh, than the pin will be looking to start on port and duck the fleet uh, no doubt we'll have a number of starboard tackers as well but it looks to me like a number of boats are, are setting up uh, for a port uh, there's the Phillips brothers farthest left in your screen almost uh, up at the boat end of the line uh, so they're going to try for a conventional start and then tack when they can Wow, why would you do that, having just profited so well from the right-hand side? I'm quite surprised to see that. Well, you can see how little competition there is for a good boat end start right now. So if you've got the skills, uh, it's also a pretty low-risk option. You'll see a bunch of pileups on that port tack option, I think, today. And um, you're talking about the Phillips, or are you talking I'm about talking Yago Mara here well, also trying to win the pin? And I'm talking about, yeah, why, why is the pin so popular? Yeah, it could be that it's that it's uh, favored, as in the angle right now. I wouldn't have thought that was a primary consideration no, for I'd, these guys. No, I'd give up. I'd give up any advantage at the pin. Yeah, to... it can't be that far off. Yeah. Uh, but we can see, you know, uh, Mara. Uh, Diego Botten and Yago Mara, Spain 97, setting up to win the pin, and, and actually without much competition right now. Um, but we see the, the last race leaders farthest right in the screen, Mackenzie and McCarty, uh, New Zealand 18. They're setting up for the Port Tech option. So are the Phillips brothers. Uh, we can see below them. It actually does look quite pin favored. We'll see how far Botten and Mara have to bear away uh, as they accelerate with nine seconds to go here. Okay, so can they hold on? Uh, the Spanish... For this start, looks like they've pulled off a really nice start off the pin end. Let's see if it does them any good. They've done exactly what James Peters and Finn Sterrett did in the previous race. And funnily enough, Peters and Sterrett only four boats along from the Spanish. So Peters and Sterrett repeating what they hope won't be uh, uh, the same mistake from the, the first race. While a load of other boats, I'm, I'm, I don't often see that many port tax starters. We're pretty much seeing an even split between starboard and port tax starters here, Ben. So the fleet has really woken up to the importance of getting out to the right-hand side of the course. Maybe not these guys, but these guys are still gambling on the left. And to see someone of the caliber of ESP 97, um, Botin and Lopez going out this side, I'm quite surprised to see it. Yeah, I mean, the, with with the fleet so split, you know, like Button and Mara, I, I'd take that all day. If you get given the pin the way they did, there was hardly they were no one competed with them for it from the last minute. Um, you know, the, they'll want that. I mean, they'll think it's powerful. Obviously, we saw how much we thought the right did uh, well last time. Actually, in the replay, we see those Canadians, Heinzman and Barnes, uh, with a wonderful punch through. So <laughs> they're loving life right now. Well, you, then, you can, uh, you're Canadian, but I'm going to be Canadian at the moment. You can be Spanish. So, so you are the more highly rated Spanish team going out to what I believe is the wrong side of the course. Um, I want to be the less favored Canadians, but going out to what I believe to be the right side of the course, which is the right side of the course. You know, as long as uh, Button and Mara choose a, a good shift to come back on, they, there should be stuff from the left to do fine with. You know, not, you're not always trying to win the start uh, uh, by doing something unconventional like the port tech option. But, you know, so Mara and Nilpas, they're focusing right now on getting the boats off their hip. They, they can't tack right now, probably, with Grummet and Budge in there. You know, they could probably tack, but they need a couple more meters to, to be guaranteed, although right now it does look like they can tack and cross. Only That's one boat stopping them now, and, and they're going anyway, so it looks like they think they can cross GBR 234, which they do extremely comfortably. So, yeah, you're, you're right, Ben. They, they haven't gone as far as Peters and Sterrett did on the, uh, the previous race, and now will they be able to get over and be able to defend themselves against any attack from the right-hand side? Yeah, I mean, there'll be plenty of wind uh, on the median, and, and anything on the median to, to even lift it, uh, and they'll be fine, but they have a long way to go. They, they've got probably half a kilometer or, or, or 700 meters of separation between them and the far right boats, and, um, you know, they'll be hoping right now that the, they get enough wind and, and a decent angle to get 
most of that gauge caught up because the other guys will be getting relatively close to a ley line as well. Uh, so this is their max separation, if you will, from, from what we think is going to be that favored side. Uh, they're showing to be the leaders on the tracker right now. Uh, so it seems like they've chosen a, a reasonable opportunity to tack. Uh, <laughs> we can see her camera boat being pushed out by... Uh, this is Lamaru, uh, Bart Lamaru. I, I th no, I think Hootman? it's, it's Hoopman. Okay. Skidio <laughs> Hoopman, who, who was doing so well in the previous race as well. Yeah, a little uh, bit of confirmation bias there, you know. <laughs> Still going left. Uh, like, it's, uh, it, we, we thought he did terribly coming left on that second beat. Uh, and, yeah. And, and dropped back a lot, but he's still... You know, for whatever reason, he thinks it's the way to go still. Yeah, didn't have to go nearly as far as he's gone, so I wonder why Hootman likes that side. Anyway, here we, here we are back with the Spanish leading from the left-hand side of the course, but will they be leading when they converge with the boats that started on Port Tack and are out on the right-hand side of the course? According to the tracking, they're doing extremely well. They are leading overall, not just on the left-hand side. So uh, there was me and my big mouth thinking that Canada was going to be doing well on the right-hand side. But we don't have every boat in this picture, so th there's a few more boats around the Phillips Brothers there that aren't uh, lit up. Um, so there's still quite a few boats, and, th and that's still a fair bit of separation, but it does look like Button and Mara have uh, managed to get uh, most of the way back, if not all the way back to reduce their risk, and I think we can see the boats on the far side, they're attacking back already. This is uh, one of the younger Australian teams, uh, Hansen, I believe his name is. Aus yeah, Hansen and Hoffman, Australia 71. That's uh, bottom of the picture, and then we catch up with, that'll be Grummet, I think, in the British, just I underneath the scoreboard. I think two, three, four, if that's what you're looking at, is yeah. them. And they were on the hip of the Spanish. Back Ooh. with our leaders. So we should, they should start to converge here with some of the boats that are coming in from the right, and we'll see if the Spanish have managed to take the pin end in for a lead. They look really steady. Look how rock steady they are as they go. A couple uh, waves to go over, but it never tilts the boat uh, either heel or yaw. So they've, they've got themselves dialed in. Look how uh, very little movement. Just pivot the boat pivots around their body weight, and they're starting to pass some of those boats on the right. Looking extremely comfortable right now. It's only about a 40 meter lead right now over the top right hand boat. So we saw how much f or how little 40 meters mattered in the first race. There's plenty of shifts out here for passing lanes uh, and that's actually dropping. So they're actually less uh, down to 30 meters as may possibly they're having to take a bit of a header. That was see that first wobble. Oh, that's for a keel boat. <laughs> so that guy's getting a front view action of the <sighs> racing as uh, Button and Mara have to draw have to duck a, uh, a tourist. Uh, cost them a meter or two at possibly the worst time of the race because it does seem like the far right is going to come in a little bit here. And uh, I don't think we're going to see Mara and Button and Mara make it all the way across this time. Fisher and Graf coming out a long way left. There's our keel boat in picture sailing through the middle of this uh, Olympic class course at Kielavoka. But that's the nature of Kielavoka. It is a festival of sailing. Thousands of boats come out across the water in the Kieler Fjord, and sometimes you have to contend with that kind of traffic. But uh, the Germany 3, bottom left of picture, looking very exposed on the left-hand side. I wonder if they're feeling that they're on a big lift that they just really don't want to tack on. We talked to Fabio Graf and asked him if he thought he had a hometown advantage, and he, he, he said he didn't believe in it, and uh, I guess we're going to find out why. Right. Well, we'll, we'll see. Maybe it's, maybe it's not going to be so bad for them, but uh, they certainly are very hev heavily leveraged out on the left-hand side of the course as they go into the tack. <laughs> Excuse me. Back Take. at the front of the course, we can see the Phillips brothers and Button Mara uh, are together uh, coming up to their uh, meeting point to see if the right of the... Oh, no, so Phillips are still on port. So both both teams continue to go to the far right side of the course, and, uh, you know, they're very even. So there have been a couple good routes up the, up the course today, and we can see McCarty and McKenzie, uh, 18, just going left to picture. They won that first race, or they didn't. They came second in the end. Probably that's the Canadian Heinzman and Barnes coming center of picture straight at us. Uh, if they get lucky, that, that could be a ley line. Uh, if the no one tacks on them, there we see the leaders coming across, huh? Button and Mara. It does look like a left shift. So we've had a left shift at the top here, and Button and Mara have managed to gain quite a few meters just at the very end. Uh, and there's a couple, and, and the boats on the far right have had to take a terrible angle in here. So Button and Mara taking in the final shift uh, and have gained quite a few meters right at the top. Right, okay. So um, not as one sided as perhaps I thought. It, the, the way that Hoopman, uh, front of picture, is sailing, he's sailing over the top of the Austrian boat. I, I wonder if he's overstood the ley line. Well, right now, Button and Mara have gone ex considerably past what the mean ley line was, but that, that's also when they were on port. That's how they were able to make so many gains. 
uh, right at the top. There they are coming in at the mark. So we'll see if it. If, we'll see if they're overstood. Right now they're still they're sailing a little fat. So uh, they're a little bit below uh, prime close hauled. It looks like they're overstood and reaching in. So yeah, another oh, another shift flying, here, isn't it? Yeah, well, this is this is fun sailing when you're in the lead and reaching in, and no one's to the left of you. They'll be feeling good. We'll see if they do a jibe set the way uh, most people did, or they've obviously come now mostly from the left. A lot of uh, traffic for them to get through on the jibe set if that's what they choose. At the moment, going. Yago the... Mara comes in with a tight stretch. They're going to straight set there, so just avoid the traffic, get out of the way, and. Um, that's the Phillips brothers in second, so another good race from them uh, shaping up. And then we've got Grummet, James Grummet, uh, 234, and I can't work out the sail number in that other Brit. That's uh, Could be Ollie Ardridge or James Johnson. Hunter and Batten. I think it's Hunter and Batten, the other boat that you were talking about. Uh, Followed by Heinzman and Barnes. They were my pick for after doing that port tax start. The Phillips McCarty also McKenzie's, did the port tax start. McCarty and McKenzie round, and that's about seventh right there. Oh, that's is that Hootman that just tacked right in front of? Uh, I think it's Lambria. Oh, that's Lambria, yeah. Lambria and Van Vogt. So McCarty and McKenzie um, doing having an okay race. And we see Peterson stare at uh, deep again. So what not a very good on? day from those two so far. With uh, they didn't even have a good start when they start when they aim for the pin that time. Oh, we got a battle here as the uh, Norwegians are trying to roll over the top. The of crew the hasn't even clipped in yet as they go for the high lane. And uh, and actually they've got the, the the Dutch there and sandwiched between them and the Polish, so they've got to have to jive out. So it could be a pass there for Math Matheson. And we can see Button and Mara did jibe, didn't expose themselves to anyone uh, going too far left. So Grummet and Budgen, Budden, they'll be happy with that lane, uh, getting to lead the fleet over and, and get all the puffs first, uh, presuming they're coming in off that side. This is uh, oh, they've jibed. Fisher and Graf hoisting with them. Is this a replay then? Must be. It's a replay. Yeah. And so jibe set for Fisher and Graf. You can see them top of picture in the graphics. Gosh, Hunter and Batten, I wonder why they've jibed there. Because uh, I would have thought they'd be thrilled to lead the pack out to that corner, but maybe they got a light patch or something, and, and they're coming through the middle of the course. Button and Mara continue uh, to lead uh, Phillips and Mara out to that side of the course that's been so favored so far. Very healthy lead as well. It is 140 meters or more over the Phillips brothers, winners of the first race just 20, 30 minutes ago. So Phillips Brothers, as they did in Weymouth at the Europeans recently, turning it on for the qualifying, really. I mean, they're, they're going to be up in the top few at the end of the day if they carry on like this. Button and Mara through their jibe, looking very comfortable as they use that beautiful teal-colored spinnaker, um, all lit up, heading down to the lured gates. They've got a bit of a choice here to go uh, how, to, how to best protect their lead. I reckon they'll... Uh, try and go the straight way into their marks here. If uh, well, they've actually got one more jibe to go. They got the mainsail quite far out. Is that is that standard? Or it looks to me like maybe they're actually quite pushed there. In this amount of wind, they'll still be looking to get that main as powerful as possible and, and just uh, and with as little drag as possible. So that's probably they've got telltales to make sure both windward and leeward side are flying. Uh, so that'll in that amount of wind uh, probably the the angle is, is quite far back compared to what we might expect. Okay. Well, I mean, you can see a lot of curl on the Phillips Brothers kite as well. I don't think they've overstood the ley line, but really pushing the boat as high into the breeze as they can, maximize the, uh, the apparent wind. And the Phillips Brothers looking very fast downwind generally. Yeah, that was, I think, the lesson of the last quad was just how hard uh, Burling and Took pushed the boat on the downwinds. So uh, l really dialing it up basically as much as they could, as much of the time as they could. And uh, the Phillips brothers certainly doing that. They've, they've tested that ley line hard. That's a, that's a long distance to call a ley line from in relatively shifty and puffy conditions. And they've Whereas, closed the gap as well. I mean, it's down to 60 meters. It was up to 140 meters at one point. And I think the Phillips will have one less jibe to do than the Spanish potentially as well. Yeah, Phillips should be on ley line here. They'll, they'll probably sail straight through, whereas Button and Mara have one more jibe to do, which, which they, you know, barring a wind shift, uh, here they go. Nice, clean Beautiful jibe. Beautiful jibe, wasn't it? Yeah. But it wasn't, it's not super windy. They haven't, you know, they're not lit up the way we see some of them do. They, they, they were tempering their movement through the boat and uh, not fully up to speed here. So I expect to see the Phillips brothers close the gap even more uh, as we get into this. Oh, gosh, they've done two jibes. So they obviously, oh, no, they just... Uh, Oh no, they did no, do two jibes. It's a jibe drop. Beautifully executed. Wow. 
And you, you can see one of the other starts just kicking off across one of the other courses just to back a picture. What an amazing rounding by the Spanish. Beautiful boat handling right there. They made that look so easy. Yeah, the, the turn rate on Button there, he just got that perfect so that the chute went down nice in a wind shadow, rolled right into the jibe and right into the rounding uh, without interrupting any of the flow. We see the Phillips brothers have gone uh, to the far side, so they are looking for that separation that's done them well uh, in the first race and this first leg of this race too. And, uh, you know, this race is shaping up very similarly to how the last race did with McCarty and McKenzie in the lead uh, substituted this time for Button and Mara. Basically, Button and Murrow won the left-hand side of the first beat. The Phillips brothers won the right-hand side of the first beat. And we see those two teams choosing the exact same sides of the course as they did on the previous beat. little so, header there from Button and Murrow. I wonder if they'll tack and go back or if it was just a bit of a wind shadow. Yeah, it, it, That's it does another... look like, yeah. Is, is that the opportunity to tack, you wonder? Yeah. Well, it depends if they think they're missing out on something or if they think they're leading the right way. Or, I mean, bearing in mind their biggest competition is over the right-hand side of the course right now, you'd think they'd want to defend. I'm being in the lead, yeah, it does seem like that, but uh, these guys are right top. I think they're second in the world right now, so that they do know what they're doing. No, they probably do, don't they? First in the world, a GBR5. They're round, but they're not looking like number one in the world right now, the way they've been sailing so far today. Got a lot of making up of the ground to do. They're in 12th place. Yeah, I mean, it's really critical that uh, teams that are trying to win this championship don't pile up a lot of points in qualifying because it's much harder uh, in gold fleet later to, to catch back up. Uh, don't forget, a 12th in this race is really like a 36th, uh, which is no, no finish you want to keep uh, if you're trying to win a championship. And look at the mark rounding of India going around the far side. I mean, we're, we're getting so used to seeing perfect roundings, and then the Indians really not in the same ballpark in terms of level of boat handling. It just uh, brings it home to me just how much work Peters and Sterrett have to do right now because their boat handling is so crisp, and yet they're not in the right place on this race course. Phillips sailing out top left of picture right now, leading out to the right-hand side, but Hansen and Hoffman from Australia out furthest right, top of our screens. Just looking at Peters and Sterrett here, so they've already hitched up again. They're, they're really committed to using the middle of this course uh, and using the shifts as the, the, you know, the offshore wind does have a lot of shifts to it. So I wonder if we can get a, a, a maneuver count at the end of the couple races here to see if they've been consistently doing more maneuvers than everyone else. Because I know in the first race, or the first beat, they did a few extra tacks and, and it looks like they're repeating that uh, on this leg. Front two boats now on a converging course. It looks like the Spanish is still going to be ahead of the Phillips, but that number is coming down 40 meters, 35 meters. Oh, it looks like the Spanish are on a bad heading. Is this the opportunity for the Phillips to cross in front and take the lead? They took the lead of the previous race. Looks like Phillips are moving up into the lead yet again. Yeah, and we can see, see that in real uh, life here. They've made that cross. So they'll now have to get right, and there, there's a quite a few teams exposed right of them. Um, but, you know, we saw that decision. Both teams chose their lured gates. They could have e each team could have easily chosen the opposite gate, but they both wanted the sides they did, and the Phillips brothers got it right. So we'll see how hard they commit back to, uh, to getting right, because it probably feels like they're on a lift right now, and they won't want to. But now they're the team exposed, and we see how that trap of, of I think, probably sailing... Uh, Sailing left is for probably pretty easy because it's hard to find a header to go back on. And we can see well, a lighted is there. They've yeah. I mean, not, not a lot of breeze there for the Aussies right now. And that, surely they must be looking over their shoulder wondering how much breeze there is on the right-hand side as they go into attack. Now the Spanish tacking, so there's going to be another converging course. But Australia 71 and the Norwegians looking very strong on the right-hand side. So have the two leading boats, the Spanish and the, the Phillips brothers, given up too much leverage to the boats that are attacking the right-hand side of the course because we could see yet another lead change. Yeah, it was interesting there to see if the Phillips uh, will... It looks like they've got uh, they've got caught back up on their on their shift, so it wasn't quite as ugly as when we saw them tack, and they have maintained their lead. They've actually found a very good shift on the left hand side, haven't they? Yeah, you can see their path there, just edging out a screen. Uh, it was it was they did tack on on the header, and then uh, but it was just so light, it didn't look like it was going to be great. But uh, but they've done well, found a route forward, and they've extended the lead all the way to 100 meters. Uh, which is fantastic considering they rounded 50 meters behind in the f at the bottom of this, mar of this course. And actually crossing comfortably ahead of their Australian teammates and the Norwegians just to the right of Australia 66. So that was actually a beautiful shift 
taken by the Phillips brothers. Um, but the Spanish, they're still in second place. That's, that's no disaster whatsoever. Um, but they will be kicking themselves, I think, that they gave up uh, the right-hand side to the Phillips. I, I mean, yes, they wanted to win the pin in, in the first race. Um, and, and I suppose we should say the left still comes good. We've just seen the Phillips profit from, from finding a left-hand shift. So maybe it's just down to the fact that the Phillips brothers are picking these shifts better than the Spanish right now. Yeah, we. I mean, the Phillips brothers, they moved up from, were they second round of the, in the first race? Anyways, they've, they've yeah. been moving up consistently and finding these pockets, and, and they're obviously dialed in. They do love it here in Kiel. The, the Aussie contingent puts, uh, puts Kiel on the top of their list. I think this is about as cold as it gets in Australia, all the way down to 20 probably. So they've got to get out of there and come up to Kiel and get their racing in. But uh, maybe it's just the hot weather. I mean, maybe the Aussies only really come good when the when the weather's this hot. Sailing in California as we are today, and uh, the Phillips brothers from from Melbourne, where it can be really hot as well. I mean, they they are certainly red hot right now. The Australians in Australia 66, bottom left of picture. That's, a huge, that's a huge lead, and they're you know they've, they've got no leverage now uh, to deal with. It. Everyone that they need to. Uh, defend from is on the same tack as them and in the same wind, so they're feeling very comfortable right now, almost directly upwind. Are, are they even over the ley line? Where, the way that the main looks like it's quite far out, or, or they're just putting, um, sort of getting down onto the line of the Spanish, but they are, they've really got that boat lit up right now. Yeah, and with the main out like, like that, you know, it's a sort of unsteadier condition, but they're rock solid in it, so they've obviously got that, uh, that trim dialed in, so they're very comfortable with it. There's no flapping, uh, hardly any adjustment, even though it's fairly shifty uh, and puffy so the they've got their settings dialed in which we would expect nothing less from the Aussie team um, and look how steady that is it's very flat water obviously which helps out but um, just a, a minor adjustment there for the shifts got a bit of a header perfect time for it and actually they're going to tack on that a classic 49 attack both running through really quickly straight out onto the handles on the new side and they'll surely be on the lay line and coming into the top mark very soon with the Spanish tacking on the same line as them. But the, the distance stretching away even more for Australia right now. And also, we should note, um, Grummet and Button from Great Britain, one, the, one of the, uh, the, the, the squad members for, for Britain, but by no means uh, typical front runners, having a fantastic race in third place. Looks like uh, Peters and Sterrett are also uh, had a good beat here and moved up into the oh, well, into fifth. Yeah, so we we saw them around the Leeward mark in twelfth. Lots of opportunities on this race course. It's basically perfect racing. Uh, didn't have to probably only had to sail about ten minutes away from shore as they pop that vang, get the main powered up for this downwind, hoist from Sam, and they're going to straight set. Oh, get. what a beautiful set! All standard stuff for these full-time sailors, but uh, a lot to admire there in the way that they've just done that rounding. So you saw how Sam, he, he released the, the Vang as he went in to bear away, got, and then he released the Cunningham before he got stepped back to get just as much power in that mainsail as possible. Button and Mara doing the rounding as well. In comes Iago, get that spinnaker up. Powerful, uh, powerful crew is Iago, and... Uh, Again, he goes oh. up. He hasn't released his Cunningham yet, so sometimes he'll get up to speed and then creep forward at some point and release the rest of the sail. Well, they're in quite a gust there, aren't they? So, um, I mean, they, they probably don't need to worry about the Cunningham too much. Going for an early jibe, I wonder if they're on the attack. Oh, no, they're, Phillips have already jibed, so they're actually following the, uh, the, the Aussies down the same track. They must feel that getting down to that side of the course is, is so much better that they can do nothing other than follow the leaders, which is making life tactically very easy for the Phillips brothers, looking to square away their second win out of two races so far at Kielabocca. What a wonderful race course here with teams on all sides of the course at all tacks at all times. Uh, you know, it'll keep every mi everyone's mind active as they try and work out what's best to do at any point in time. Am I lifted? Am I in a puff? Uh, it's it's which not way a one-way course, protecting? is it? No, it's wonderful. And Peters and Sterrett, the world number ones, up to fifth place after being back in 12th or 13th not very long ago. So proving that those extra tacks they were making, you can make them work. So really smart sailing from Peters and Sterrett. So different tactic here, this time downwind from the Phillips Brothers. They've jibed. Uh, the last two downwinds we've seen them, they've gone as far to the far ley line as possible. But this time they're going down the middle of the track, protecting against Button and Mara, who, who jibed earlier. And um, so they're, they're keeping uh, their tactical options sound and not giving up too much leverage. 
But uh, does you know they did wait a little bit, and uh, Bot Namara do have a few hundred meters separation on them, so they're they they can see their competition in the as, as they look forward, which is a comforting. Uh, but the Phillips brothers always like to be further out to this side of the course than anybody else, don't they? So yes, they've jived earlier, but they're still the uh, the furthest right boat. Um, so yes, they. Uh, they are defending, they're pretty much in a match race now. All they've got to do is beat the Spanish. There's such a gap back to the, uh, what, 500 meters back to the third place boat, which is the Polish boat. Uh, just phenomenal We're runaway. We're see them this. head into a jibe here as, Mar as uh, Button and Mara have also jibed. So they're just matching the Spanish jibe for jibe. Uh, no error there. That was a beauty jibe. So they're directly downwind of their nearest competitor uh, and most of the way down the run here. So... Phillips Brothers kicking this regatta off with style. Uh, if they can hold on here, that'll be their second win from two races, and you know sets them up wonderfully for a uh, for a qualifying series with a super low scores, so they can be really aggressive in Gold Fleet. We saw uh, Will Phillips sailing with uh, Ian Jensen at the Aarhus 2018 Regatta uh, World Championship last year, and they were you know leading the regatta at one point, and all the way I think in the top five halfway through the regatta, and then had a bad day on the very final day to drop back. Uh, so they definitely got it in them to have a run of good results, and we can see why they dialed in on all aspects: uh, the wind, their competitors, and their boat speed. Obviously, fantastic. The Spanish jiving earlier, to the Australians now jiving to respond. So really, not opening the door for the Spanish to try anything that would get them past and as long as they can maintain good jibes like they have done just there no one's going to take this away from the australians there's a lot on the line for the australians here for for will phillips entire 49er career uh he's had nathan outerich to look up at and, and sort of hope he can pass but obviously that was much easier said than done and now the entire australian uh, olympic uh, spot is open with Nathan having switched over to uh, NACRA 17. So all these guys who were training and training partners of Outerage and Jensen for, through the years now have a shot to get to the games themselves. And uh, those shots don't come around very uh, all that often. So the Phillips brothers going full metal. And pretty much on the same line as the Spanish now. So no way back for the Spanish as they sail past the gate marks and are about to cross the finish line. A second race win for Australia 66, the Phillips brothers. How good is that? You can't do better than that. Phillips 66, got to love it. And here come uh, Botten and Mara. Very good race finish. We, we saw them win the pin and win the first beat and uh, learn, learn their way through the race and, and just lost the one uh, spot. So good for them for not uh, dipping into it. That's McCarty McKenzie. Uh, up Where did they third. come from? Yeah. So, so really good sailing. We, we haven't said much about them all race, but McCarty and McKenzie, two good races from them. They were leading the first race for so long, just missed out. They got second in the first race, third in the next race. Very good sailing by the young Kiwis. And now coming down, Buksak and Vizbitsky, the experienced Poles, just holding off Grummet and Budden, but it's going to be a race between the two British teams with Peters and Sterrett breathing down the necks of Grummet and Budden and Peters and Sterrett coming from a long way back in this race after a fairly poor start. A very good recovery by the world number ones. Just coming across the line, Buksak and Vizbitsky going into a jibe, jibing that aubergine Jenica for fourth place across the finish line in race two of the yellow part of qualifying. And that's... Uh, We're looking for Peters and Sterrett. We thought that they would be coming in here. Wonder, oh, there they are. So they've dropped back one place on this downwind uh, to from fifth to sixth. Not too bad. I don't know where Mc uh, Mackenzie and McCarty came from. We weren't talking about them all race, so I don't know if they suddenly sprung back into life on the tracking, but um, th that's, uh, I think, Lambria and Van Voet from that the was, Netherlands. That was the Belgians, also just a little bit overstood on the finish line. Can't tell who that uh, Antipodean is. Very tight finishes here. The Belgians come in just a bit behind uh, Norwegians. Norwegians having another good race. And Fabian Graf and uh, Fischer there uh, dropped back quite a bit because they were uh, in the top four earlier in the race. Down And there's the Canadian, a couple more Brits, or one more Brit and an American. We can't work out that number. Snow and Wilson are the Americans. And here are the stats. Phillips Brothers, 13 tacks, just a little bit less distance than the Spanish who are behind them. Very similar boat speeds and top end boat speeds, not quite as high as the first race, so maybe not as windy as race one. And McCarty and McKenzie, only seven tacks, don't half the number of tacks. Must be an error in that. There's no way. Oh, uh, yeah, no. Look, looking <laughs> at the distance, yeah, something didn't work out there. So we'll ignore the uh, the, the Kiwi stats. Uh, Buxak and Vizbitsky. 
13 tax and Grummet and Bun just 11. Um, so we'll keep it just uh, on the uh, the video for a little bit longer um, and uh, just see the rest of the course coming across if we can just wipe away the, the screen. So that was race two of the Kiel Avoca qualifiers for the 49er race and uh, well the Phillips brothers I haven't put a foot wrong. So uh, we're going to go back to the water and we're hoping to get an interview with one of the sailors. So that's Will Phillips that we're about to hear from. To um, not worry about anyone else and try and find our own path around the course. Well. And, um, and we seem to have been able to do that quite well in the first two races. So yeah, it's, it's good. What is your tactic for the next races? Uh, yeah, we'll, I think we'll try and not change too much. Um, yeah, just try and start clear and stay in phase with the wind. That will we'll keep it quite simple. That sounds too easy. I mean, um, the boat speed is not, uh, you're not the fastest today, but you keep the distance very short. Is that kind of your tactic? Um, well, we hope we're going okay, but with our speed as well as our distance. But um, we're trying to just do a combination of distance and speed. So far, so what is your goal for the Kila week? First to uh, join the Yellow Fleet? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely Gold Fleet um, would be a goal for us. But um, yeah, we're really just here to get some training in before we head to Japan. So any uh, any result we can get, I guess, is a bonus. Thank you so much. So, also ihr hört ja, ähm, ihr, Sie sehen es eher als Trainingswoche hier. So sieht es ja ganz gut aus. Wenn Sie so weiter trainieren, dann reicht es ja vielleicht sogar am Ende erstmal für die Goldgruppe, wie Sie sagen, und dann vielleicht auch zum Kieler Woche Sieg. Und dann sehe ich für Tokio da auch gar keine Probleme. Phillips, uh, very happy with the way things are going so far. Of course, they know that there's a long way to go, so uh, sailors will never get too far ahead of themselves. They're not going to start celebrating. Uh, I was I was able to look back at that race and find out where Mackenzie and McCarty made their gains. So they uh, they basically followed the exact same path as the Phillips brothers on that race. Uh, they went a little bit right at the bottom of the course, then crossed and and. In that same maneuver that we saw the Phillips brothers cross uh, Yago Mara and Diego Botten, uh, they, they were on the same tack, and then they also followed the Phillips brothers into the mark there. So there was a, a pretty optimum course up there, the middle middle right, uh, that the two teams in first and third were able to take advantage of. Okay, okay. So well done to those Kiwis. Um, they, they must be second in this group, and uh, so fantastic sailing by the Kiwis and, and meanwhile on, on the other side of the draw it'd be quite interesting um, if you can bring up the numbers on uh, on how the red and the blue groups are doing um, bearing in mind that we've got perhaps the best in the world um, the recent winners of the European Championship Pete Burling and Blair Chuk, Chuk the reigning Olympic champions as well competing in in one of the other fleets so uh, so how, how are things going overall where are those Phillips brothers lying overall well, the Phillips brothers with two bullets are, of course, on top of the table. We don't have results in yet from the, I'm not sure which fleet it is, maybe the blue fleet, but um, but in the red fleet, uh, Megendorfer and Spranger, uh, Germany 22, who, uh, who had a great world championship two years ago. Uh, they won the other race that's happening right now, and we're just waiting for the final results to come in uh, from the third fleet that hasn't quite finished yet. But uh, who else did well in that race? Uh, it was uh, Burling and Tuke at a second. So uh, no, no foot wrong from them, a three and a two to start the regatta. Um, and just look at the color of those flags in the top five right now. And you, and you can check this at home on sapsailing.com. Um, they they've all got the Antipodean flag. So yes, it's Australia in number one, the Phillips brothers that we've been talking about so much. Below them, four Kiwis at the moment. Okay, two, only two races in. But four out of the six Kiwis that are here are currently in the top five overall. Yeah, and we'd expect. Well, we've seen, you know, uh, Peters and Sterrett stumble out of the gate. We've seen the German team stumble out of the gate in their home waters. Uh, Fantilla brothers, they've had a 12 and a 3, so, uh, you know, nothing too spectacular from them. Uh, Jonas Warr, the 2008 uh, Olympic champion with a 2 and an 11. So uh, it is a super deep fleet, but those Antipodeans coming out of their uh, winter training sessions uh, have really done really, uh, fantastically well in the spring European season. 
So there we have the numbers for you. And uh, so uh, the Phillips with uh, the absolutely perfect score, but Burling and Chuk breathing down their necks with a three and a one from uh, one of the other qualifying that, fleets. That uh, Keon brothers that were in third, I'll, I'll just warn people, they only had one of the two races in there, so they were scoring just a fourth, and we don't know what they have in their second race yet. But they were. we were talking to their coach earlier this morning, and they're 2018-29er Youth World champions. Uh, the skipper was, I think, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, um, still very young. And bearing in mind, uh, we got two McKenzie's out here. So we got um, a McKenzie crew in, uh, in one side of the draw, and we got a McKenzie crew on our side of the draw that we've been, we, been watching, um, we're selling with uh, McCarty and with a three and a two so far. So yeah, you, you wonder why those McKenzie's don't sail together. You see so many brothers like the Phillips brothers sailing together, but uh, we got two McKenzie's vying for the same place to go to the games. All behind Burling and Tuke, let's All not forget. All behind Burling and Tuke. Um, so uh, yeah, with that proviso, of course, yeah, there's a f there's a few teams here like uh, Lefebvre and Pelsmaker who we're watching in this court in this race. Uh, Belgian 24, you know, they're down in the 40s right now, not even qualifying for Gold Fleet. They were a team that I expected to be challenging for the for the lead by the time this quad came around. So we're what are we looking at here, Andy? Um, so we've got we got the three D just show, just showing us the lie of the land and um, the breeze coming down across the course. So so the breeze coming pretty much directly off the land. And uh, so in the first race, this seemed to be a slight right-hand trend. In race two, it, it, well, if anything, the, the left was looking more powerful at times. That's certainly where the leaders came from early on, those, uh, the Spanish. Um, but uh, we, we saw the Phillips brothers uh, round ahead of them from the right and then find a fantastic... Uh, line from the left hand side. So as we look here, just on the top left of picture, that's this uh, built up area of of Kiel, of the of Kiel Shilksee, which is the sort of the buildings in the area, and then basically b d directly upwind of that Windward Markets fields. So uh, the way I've heard our uh, guru Marcus Bauer explain it is it's just the, the wind is a little less disturbed coming in over those fields, and that's why you might see a little bit of uh, maybe more consistent higher breeze on the right side, but obviously in any shift, uh, in any offshore wind there are shifts so I think that's how we're seeing uh, teams get uh, get back to the right or, or take good right uh, good good port tax is if they get a bit of left shift they can take that to the right but there, I think there's probably on average a little more wind to the right hand side of this course uh, because of the less disturbance on the land ab above the course we can see the teams uh, in very light grayed out. Uh, they're doing tuning runs right now, so just checking that their settings are optimal. Uh, we believe the wind is still building, so they will have to adjust their settings in between races uh, and just make sure they're going as fast as possible in these flat water conditions. So bearing in mind uh, that the leaders at the top mark last time ran with the Spanish who won the pin and went out to the left, and the boat that was second ran with the Phillips brothers that started on port underneath the fleet and went out right, what would you choose for the next start, Ben? Well, like I said off that first, off that previous start, if someone's going to give you the boat, uh, the pin end of the line in a, in a above ten knots, where we're getting the ability to go fast right from the beginning, makes a big difference. I think you take it all day. Like Button and Mara, you could see uh, maybe they were a little bit nervous at times, is that is they didn't quite get back across, maybe as soon as they would have preferred. But in the end, you're ahead of certainly the half that's going with you, and probably a bunch of the guys going right as well. And if you know, all these guys can come off the pin on time. Uh, if it's given to them. So, like, that's a really low-risk option for a top team is, is to take that. Uh, the Phillips brothers, though, they, they came through on port. They've probably practiced that a lot. And also, if you do that properly, you get freedom uh, to steer the lane you want. So what's really tough is what we saw uh, Peters and Starrett start, where they were fourth up from the pin, couldn't tack, also couldn't bear off and, and go fast. And... You know, my, so, my training partners back in my day used to say the worst place to be was a pin end favored uh, uh, start, but the fourth boat up because you you don't have clear air. You're actually probably in someone's bad air because of the way the angles are, and you can't tack because it's, you're only fourth way. So m a lot of the guys get to flip off to the right or they start on port. You don't get any of those options. And we saw uh, Peters and, and Starrett, they you know had a very poor first beat and managed to move up after that. But uh, uh, It sounds so obvious when you say it as well. And, and, and they were lining up for that sort of fourth from the pin start for a long, long time. And you, you wonder what they thought they were going to get out of that start. At it was they... obvious that Button and Mara were going to make it. You know, sometimes those guys hope that the guys closest to the boat have got their line wrong, and they and they end up having to bail away, and you get in. 
but probably with about 30 seconds to go, they should have been backing up, going backwards and, and shifting out onto port and just accelerating on port. Four minutes to the start of the next race. So this will be the third and final race of the day for the uh, yellow qualifying group that we've been following. Will the Phillips brothers be able to make it a perfect hat trick and put another race win on the board after the first two races of today? So absolutely phenomenal sailing by the Australians. And then, as we just saw on the overall leaderboard, four Kiwi teams taking the next four places in, in the overall standings after two races so far in Kilavoka. Three minutes to the start of the next race. Um, and uh, you mentioned the Fantella brothers, uh, Shimo Fantella, the 470 Olympic gold medalist from Rio 2016, made the switch to the 49er uh, two years ago, sailing with his brother Mihovil Fantella. The Croatians actually coming, coming good in the 49er very, very quickly, but looking a bit average so far in this um, uh, regatta so far. You said they had a 12 and a 3, something like uh, that? 12 and a 2, so... You know, hardly a disaster. Oh, we've got an AP flying, so that's a, a delay. Uh, we do see, I think that wind speed's up. Uh, I don't know if you agree with me or not, Andy. It's uh, obviously so. a little hard to tell in the flags, but with the wind speed up, uh, usually we don't see it shift too much, but maybe the race committee wants to reset their line. That's often uh, one of the reasons we might see an AP is, is if there's just been enough shift to make the start uh, not quite square enough to get, a, to get the fleet off uh, in a reasonable way. You can see the teams will probably... Uh, well, at this point in the day, they're, they're pretty happy with they They think they understand what's going on, so they won't be wanting the extra six minutes here. We've got until the next start, uh, but they'll kill a little time and then redo their routine. They will, they'll have just been starting their routines uh, for getting their line sights, and especially if the pin's been moved, they, they have to repeat the whole thing. So what, what uh, kind of uh, chat will there be, if any, in between races, do you think? Well, for sure they're going to talk about what they want to do off the start line. With We saw half the fleet do the port tech option and go right and we saw half the fleet starting on starboard um you know that's a pretty critical thing that the things you want are the ability to attack and the ability to have clear air as soon as possible uh to get into the maximum speed um there's you know multiple ways to do it but uh but winning the pin you know only, there's only one or two teams uh, that get off on starboard super cleanly uh and quickly uh, but then that port tech option becomes really busy uh when too many teams do it so I don't know how many teams will have a predetermined de decision on whether they're going to go port or starboard uh, or, if, or, or how many teams will be playing it by ear and, and taking what opportunities arise. We saw the boat end of the line almost completely open last time, so I, I suspect it was probably pin end favored, and that's why teams didn't want to take an open lane from that side. But uh, they won't know that yet with, uh, with the resetting pin. So probably a lot of teams looking to see which way they're moving the pin and also gauging whether or not their numbers have changed uh, that they're seeing on their compasses. Um, just uh, 30 seconds or so ago, we saw a Japanese boat, Japan 26, Leo Takahashi and Ibuki Koizumi. Uh, you had a chat with uh, Leo Takahashi, the helmsman. He's not got a typically Japanese accent. Just tell us a little bit about him and what he's been up to recently. Oh, Leo Takahashi, he's, uh, he's on GP for Team Japan. They just won in New York in spectacular conditions. I mean, kind of ridiculous conditions. It was so shifty in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, but they were thrilled to, to take the win. Um, Nathan Outridge on the helm of that boat. He's, uh, he's been going up head-to-head -head with the Aussies. They, both teams have made the match race this time. But in each time, Leo Takahashi's Team Japan lost in the match race. So he, uh, he was over the moon. But, you know, young fella, full of hustle. He got back across here to get ready for racing again straight out of uh, last weekend. And I wonder um, how much confidence that gives him sailing with the best in the world, sailing with one of the all-time greats in the 49 and Nathan Outridge, getting that experience, okay, it's in a 50-foot catamaran that does up to 50 knots of boat speed, but hanging out with people like Nathan Outridge, uh, some of that magic has to rub off on you, I would have thought. I think we're seeing the level for a lot of these sailors rise right now. So many of the top 49er sailors are doing pro gigs on TP52, GC32, um, Sail GP and the America's Cup. 
like when you get to hang out with these uh, more experienced sailors all the time, it's a wonderful experience. I was talking to um, Shime Fantala, who's now steering or, or tactician on one of the TP-52s, and he said the other members of the afterguard were Morgan Larson, uh, you know, epic 49er sailor, and Ed Smythe, two-time uh, 49er world champion back in the day. So when you get to hang out with guys like that, it can only make your sailing better. And uh, so many of this fleet are given the opportunity to, to contribute to the meaningful positions on these pro circuits now because the 49er fleet's uh, so active and, and they get to sail all the time. They're, they're really in tune with and it, this it, fast it gives, racing. It gives you the right instincts as well sailing these high-speed asymmetric boats, doesn't it? It translates very nicely over to TP52 racing and seems to be relevant even for 50-foot foiling multi hulls I mean, we, we've seen that the best sailors, the best helmsmen in the last uh, six or seven years of high-speed America's Cup sailing have tended to come out of the... 49er class, not least Pete Burling and Blair Chuk, who were two key members of the winning America's Cup team in Bermuda 2017 for Emirates Team New Zealand. Yeah, I think a lot of these skills in all the um, asymmetric classes and, and the uh, apparent win classes uh, are, translates pretty evenly. You know, you're, you've got to keep an eye out for those puffs a little bit more than the shifts, and, um, and you've got to really be able to keep the boat in sync with multiple hands and doing it at the same time. You can't just rely on the skipper for the boat speed. It's got to be all the crew members in sync. And those two skills are, are vital on all these high-performance uh, high classes. So you get really tight tuning with your with your skipper and crew combination here, and that plays well in all the other classes. So we'll see how the... We'll see if we can guess from this pre-start maneuvering how the fleet's going to come off the line. Uh, a lot of a lot of boats, you know, relatively close to the boat end right now. So um, not, and we'll see if the camera pans right, how many people are hanging off to the right of the screen here, which would indicate some port tackers. But probably in the next 45 seconds, teams will have to finally commit to uh, a traditional starboard start or ducking and coming in on port. It looks like that right-hand end of the line is a lot more fancy this time. You see the Spanish who won the pin last time really looking to win the committee boat this time round. So a big switch of tactics by the Spanish. That, to me, suggests that this is a, a very different kind of start line this time. Yeah, I, I would guess that pin dropped back during that postponement, and the fleet just responded accordingly. There'll still, there'll still be some lanes off on the port tech option, but uh, oh, looks sure like a will. traditional I mean, it, start. It's for a, most mean, people right now. Well, Peterson Sterrett, third boat from the right-hand end. Still going for this end of the line, so they've been very consistent in choosing the pin end if, this, if that's where they're going to stay. We see McC McCarty and McKenzie, they're trying the port tech options. They've, they've committed already. Uh, we also, who's that Aussie 71, Hansen? Um, looking like they're going to be lining like up for a port tack start. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, you know, it's very stressful uh, doing the starboard starts in a 49er fleet because they're, the positioning is so critical. A little bit easier in this bigger wind and flat water. Um, but those guys hanging off, uh, sometimes they actually lose track of the time a little bit in the positioning because they don't have the, the boats around them to gauge off of. Uh, Just one minute to go, and at the moment, Peterson stare at what are they up to? They're suddenly accelerating and, and moving to the bottom of picture. Are they going to be lining up for a port tag start? Yeah, for sure. At this point, they've committed to the port tag start. Uh, you've really got three choices, uh, whether you want to be first off the right, uh, so so kind of starting lower in the fleet, and you, the reason you might do that is so that you don't want someone to come off the boat end of the line and tack on you. Or if you think the pin end of the line's favored or you want a few more options, you, t you start closer up to the pin, which gives you um, a little more visual on the whole fleet and, a, and, a, and, a, and the ability to pick your spot where you, you cross earlier. Um, you get, you, if you come in late, you can reach lower or you can pinch up higher in time when you're going to duck uh, all the starboard tackers with a little more control. See, McCarty and McKenzie, they're, they're in a bit of a tough spot there with the Americans below them. They've now got a call for room on the Americans. And if the Americans don't give them enough, they they're kind of lose control of what they're going to do. Whereas Peters and Sterrett coming in a little bit later. They, Oof, yeah, they you see McCarty and McKenzie, they didn't make it. See, McCarty and McKenzie had to duck because they weren't, weren't given room. And where Peters and Sterrett, with a little more control, get in. Uh, those Americans were too close to the port tech options. They didn't get it. Whereas we see, actually, I can see... Uh, Peters and Starrett had to duck a lot, so it was actually a very painful start. Whereas most of the boat started on starboard, and we can see close end here is Hootman uh, won the pin and got. He, we've, shot, we've seen him have good speed today, so uh, he, he'll be happy with this start. So none of the port tax starters have managed to break through to to draw level with the top of the ladder yet. So all the best starters have, have started on starboard tack at the moment. 
the the farthest right boat looks like it's that Heinzman Barnes team from Canada, or one of them anyway. So they've they've punched through and done well. And actually, Peters and Starrett have punched through and done okay too. Here's a replay of that start. Just take a look. McCarty and McKenzie, New Zealand 18. They don't get room to tack there. The Americans tacked inside, so they were forced to do a crash tack, Ooh, get ouch. rolled. Peters and Starrett, they saw that happening, so they were to, able to duck those Swiss, and, and then they got a clean lane through. They had to do another duck here, if I recall, uh, on a late starter. So that's the penalty for starting too close to the pin, is if other people have bad starts. Hurts. You just have to go behind them, and you end up quite deep. But eventually, they did pop through and, and got clear air. Uh, and you can see now with this 3D graphic, that was just Heinzman and Barnes outside of them, and then Peters and Starrett uh, with clear air. But uh, but you know a few boat lengths back of the gain line, but nothing too disastrous. So even with all that mix-up, Peters and Starrett managed to get a decent start. But uh, Heinzman and Barnes uh, looking like they're in the lead here, or close to it, or winning the far right. Oh, and the Phillips brothers also out there just ahead of Anson and Hoffman. Two Australian teams doing well out to the right-hand side. Phillips proving very consistent today, doing well on that side of the course. Lambria and Van Voet, they won the pin end of the line, and that's them in picture. Ned 194 currently leading this side of the course and almost doing well enough right now. They could probably tack and cross the British boats if they wanted to. Yeah, that's the next point is uh, when these guys get a header, they're going to want to be able to flip into the tack right away. And at this point, they probably can, like another few meters, and I'd say for sure. I guess it depends on how big a header is. But, uh, you know, they're pretty far committed left here, uh, and they'll be wanting to get back uh, with such a good start. They, they've given away a bit of windward gauge on the uh, other boats, uh, but they've got a lot of space around them, and they're probably the fastest boat on their side of the course right now. Belgian 24, Ian yeah, Lefebvre and uh, Tom Pelsmaker. They've got a good lane for the first time we've seen today on that f on the first uh, windward beat, so th they're a team I expect to do well. Uh, they had a lovely start out of the middle of the course, didn't they? Out of the middle of the line and, and holding onto that lane very nicely, Belgium 24. But Ned 194 flying along front of picture. They're lifted now, so being the far left boat and lifted, you know it's okay as long as you get a header eventually, but they'll be starting to get a bit nervous. Yeah, will that lift come back for them? The fastest boat on the water, the only boat doing over 10 knots, are the uh, Lambria and Van Vucht with the freedom to sail exactly where they want. On yep. board with Fischer and Graf, third in the world's last year. Having an okay but nothing special kind of day so far. Yeah, Fisher and Graf are sort of on the windward hip of this group of people going to the left, as are Button and Mara, and uh, they've seen enough, so uh, they go for their tack. Wow, so athletic going through those tacks. Ned 491 is uh, Scipio Hoopman. We spoke a little, about, a little bit about him in the first race. Back with Fisher and Graf, Germany 3, third in Aarhus in uh, very tricky conditions last year. The leaderboard uh, showing that the teams who have come left have done, seem to be doing the best so far. So we'll see if that holds as the two sides converge. Peters and Starrett incidentally did a, did a hitch up on that side. So possibly uh, maybe they had a bad lane or, or maybe they are trying to play the shifts more than some of these other boats that seem to uh, be more committed to straight line sailing. Heinzman and Barnes having another good performance out here as we go to the far sides of the course. Wood Brothers and Snow Wilson, farthest right boats in the front group and we can see Takahashi and uh, Koizumi also uh, pushing right. Heinzman and Barnes, they've been loving these port tax starts and uh, well, in fact, I don't know if they did one on this one or not, but, but getting out to the right on every start and generally being up in the top few quite early on. Yeah, it does look like it's a little painful on the right this time. It seems like the boats on the left have been in phase a little bit better, possibly. Um, it does look a little bit lighter on this side right now than the far side, but uh, possibly the guys are far enough back. We've seen some bigger shifts at the top, which shouldn't be surprising. So still quite a bit to play for as the two groups are split. You can see uh, Hootman here, Netherlands. Uh, we apologize, we don't know who he's crewing with because the Dutch. Uh, oh, that's Lambria, is it? No, that's a different uh, grouping. Well, th there we're looking at GBR 284, which is Rory Hunter and Sam Batten from Great Britain. Will Phillips and Sam Phillips tacking there, but they're not going to be leading in the top few this time round. So the, 
the the Phillips still doing okay in this race, uh, but it won't be them leading round this time. Peters and Sterrett on the left of picture, the world number ones with GBR5 on the sail. This is a bit more what we expect from them, fighting it out amongst the top group. Their, their sail just inverted there, so probably a little bit windier still than we've seen. Uh, uh, the team should be pretty warmed up and should be able to do their boat handling, but we do expect the breeze to be at its maximum right now of up to 20 knots, and uh, the, the sail flapping inside out is a bit of an indication of that. This group here pretty locked in on port as they, they cross back to the right side of the course. We're still seeing the left-hand group. The, these should be our leaders when we get to the top mark. They're quite close to the ley line on this side of the race course, so they don't have anything to play with uh, in terms of tacking. Yeah, Lambrio and Van, Van Voigt, they uh, don't seem to have had quite as good a speed uh, on port as they were on starboard. Now the leaders uh, have been, they've been overtaken by both uh, Grummet Budden and Lefebvre Palesmaker, so possibly not quite as quick for those two on port. Um, or maybe the, the shifts come right a little bit. There's a lot of boats very much in the hunt right now. No one running away with it yet. I think this is uh, it's a little dark, but I think that's the Belgian, yeah, team Lefebvre and Pelsmaker. Uh, so they're they're fighting for the lead right now with a couple of the boats, the British and uh, the Dutch. Just a little wobble there. These two uh, were not quite as steady as the Phillips brothers you were talking about earlier. Yeah, but it is windier now too. Like the, maybe it's built a little bit and the teams aren't quite set up for it. But obviously being right on the on the verge here, uh, the, the, the not too far out of phase, but a little just. Couple wobbles. You see them having to move a little bit fore and aft, so not as locked in as some of the teams we've seen who are in leading positions. Grummet and Budden from Great Britain in the middle of picture, having a good day today. One of the up and coming, but unlikely to be selected for the Olympics next year. Very much thinking of Marseille 2024, but at the moment, sailing a really, really solid day. Our Grummet and Budden. And we also see Button and uh, Mara here uh, emerge from the far right side along with that Heinzman Barnes team. So the right side has come pretty good here in the end, and we see Lefebvre Pelsmaker get passed by Button and Mara from the right. So Button and Mara leading much of the last race, overtaken on the second beat by the Phillips brothers. But is this an, another opportunity for Button and Mara to be able to lead round the Wimbledon mark? So these are almost the two extremes of the course so far, and we see after all that way uh, just a duck in it. So. Uh, Hootman there, very good beat from him. He took the pin, and in the end, he's just a one boat length shy of uh, of the lead here. Oh, but Ooh. Boat and Amara don't have the. They've got to do two tacks. This Ouch. this could be a foul here Ooh. if they force the others above close hauled. Wonder oh, if this a, could be really and they expensive. They haven't made it. They haven't made it, so they're going to have to go back onto port with tons more boats. Hootman and uh, they've taken their lead after all. So Boat and Amara make a big mistake. But you see how they didn't compound it. They didn't flip over onto port and, and do another foul. So now they do have the rights to be there and make that tack cleanly with the Austrians not gaining rights having tacked inside. So I reckon they have not fouled. And if they can get around the mark, they'll have limited the damage. That was easier said than done. That's a painful uh, way to finish a, a beat. Oh. That that was that uh, yeah as, as you say they could have made it a lot worse for themselves, but uh, look they're being rolled by other boats now they're in the worst of breeze and they're all out of sorts. It's taken a while to get the Jenica up, and now they've got to settle back down. Oh, oh and the Diego's dropped his tiller for some reason. Oh, forced to luff. They, he had dropped the main sheet earlier. I was just about to comment on that. So that and now they're forcing everyone above them. And oh, oh is it going to be a capsize? Uh, yeah. Oh. Another Spanish, oh, it's from leading this race, and now they've capsized the, the number two best in the world, and they've made an absolute porridge of that windward mark rounding. The skipper there dropped the main sheet and all that maneuvering, and it looked to me like he was trying to run in and unclip and grab the main sheet himself instead of asking his crew to get it, and then he dropped the tiller. Oh, so uh, Lessons to be learned there. Phillips Brothers and um, Mackenzie and McCarty only just going past. Meanwhile, a Canadian boat just pulling up from a capsize behind. So um, some strange stuff going on. Well, it is quite windy now. We could see the, the sail inverting a little bit in that uh, windward, and even though the guys are so locked in, uh, they get un they got unhinged here, and you can see there was no room for teams to go up and head up, and what a mess. So the Netherlands boat coming upright a lot more quickly than the Spanish boat. The Spanish boat masts still in the water. 
and those two will be livid, you know. They'll have been tight fighting mid-pack, and then all of a sudden some guy drops his tiller and they end up uh, stuck. But anyways, back to the leaders here. Let's see what's happened. Uh, Lambrio and Van, Van Voigt uh, take advantage there. They were, they were heading uh, lock and step with the Spanish, and now they've got a 140-meter lead, and we've seen them have pace. So uh, they, it'll be interesting to see what they do at this next beat because they've been very partial to the left side. Well, they've got enough of a lead, they can probably choose either side of the course and still be in the lead. But Lambria, Pim van Voet, representing the Netherlands. And you can see in that picture, the breeze is up. There's some white horses riding on the top of those, on top of that blue water, and the boat absolutely flying. These two are looking really good on this downwind. That's a... Uh, Rig that's... shaking around everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, as well as they pound through these waves. There's often, uh, you can see quite a few more keelboats, so there's often some more waves. As, uh, you can see in the background, actually, a NACRA heading out to race. So uh, the NACRA fleet uh, starting at 3, and, and so is the 49er FX for fans out there of those fleets. But yeah, it gets in keel. There's a bit more traffic uh, later in the day as lots of boats will be heading in and coach boats. So you'll see these guys having to deal with uh, waves from the wind and also waves from other boats around. But they seem to be handling it really well. Go <laughs> just going in for a jibe there. Let's see how big their lead is now. Still 140 meters ahead of Lefebvre and Pelsmaker. Seeing some different names up the front of this race. And. Uh, the Phillips brothers some way back. I saw them overtaking the capsized Spanish boat. Peters and Sterrett must fancy their chances. Looking ahead at the boats ahead of them, they, they would fancy themselves to be able to beat. So Lambrio and Van Vuyck didn't go to leyline there. They had to do two jibes. So I'd say that's a bit of an unforced error. And now a sloppy uh, lured rounding. Didn't Is get their leyline right. Is this, this nerves? Nerves setting in, do you think? Yeah, I mean, when you're not used to leading races, you don't typically have to make the choices by yourself, right? So uh, if they haven't led a lot of windy races in big fleets, uh, they'll have been relying on other people's ley lines a lot of the time, and now they've got to make the decisions on their own. And you can see that 140-meter uh, gap is now all the way down to just 20 meters as Pels make bigger on the fave. Uh, a bit of a sloppy rounding. Bit of a sloppy rounding, yeah. So you can tell these boats have plenty on right now, even though it's flat water. Late. Jibe douse from Grummet. That'll be tough. See, the crew does Ooh. very well there, even with the spinnaker not quite down. Gets out on the trapeze because he knew it was going to be painful on the rounding up. Get that uh, jib in so they can bear off and pass the main sheet and restart. Um, pieces and Sterrett just going around the world. Number one's going out. That's not a great rounding for them either, not fully up to power as they go around. So a lot of boats dropping their kites a little bit late here, putting themselves under pressure. Let's That's see how the Phillips brothers Gruff. do. They're also upset. So it's obviously windy enough that the teams aren't able to keep their boat handling dialed in perfect like we saw last race. Hansen. So Phillips brothers still having a good race, even though it's, it's not going to be another race win. Very unlikely it will be. Oh, a lot of breezes. McCarty and McKenzie. Yeah, so they managed to put it back in. And we can see ahead of them, Hanson. Uh, they've got the skippers dropped in the water, so they're stuck as the McCarty and McKenzie go, over for the, go around outside, and they'll be happy to pick up a boat like that. This breeze is definitely up. I mean, this lure mark rounding, a finished boat oh, just falling over capsize. there. And, and Germany 9-11 there, they missed the lured marks, weren't able to reach up and get inside the gate. So now they've got to figure out how to tack and then bear away. with. Buxak and Vizbitsky just avoiding the capsize. It's all over the place right now. So there, there's massive opportunities for people like the Spanish that we've yet to see. If the Spanish can wipe away those boat handling errors we saw earlier there are opportunities to overtake here we actually haven't seen them yet i wonder if they've given up and sailed in it is the third race of the day and they went came last surely, that would not. Have been... surely not <laughs> or maybe they broke their tiller you know that's true it is it's more likely that they broke their tiller and then he dropped it and then made a, such a big mistake uh, maybe. so maybe maybe that's a little bit of the story we can ask them when we get in because otherwise, I, I reckon, why would it have taken? They wouldn't. They would have got their spinnaker down and got the boat upright much quicker than we saw them. Right. But if they'd seen the broken tiller and their capsized, and it's the last race of the day, they might have just decided. Or, or maybe the the tiller extension did that horrible trick of getting stuck between the gap between the boom and the bottom of the mainsail. Oh, that's a tough that's one. That's a yeah. nasty one. <laughs> Um, so Ned194, Lambria and Van Vucht from the Netherlands, leading the Belgians, Lefebvre and Pelsmakers. I'm interested to see if Takahashi and Koizumi can uh, can catch up to these two speedsters here. 
Um, they've been training really hard with that Japanese squad who we saw are, or sorry, with that New Zealand squad who are uh, taking three or four of the top five spaces here so far. And uh, they're in a position here where, like we saw the Phillips brothers in the last races, where if they've got the speed and the, and the cunning, they can make their way through. Um, so far, these teams have separated a ton from uh, Takahashi. So it won't be about speed necessarily as, as about which side comes in. And, you know, with the, with the wind having gone up in speed a little bit, some of those effects we see might be changed. Uh, soft for these two on this side of the course at the moment. They don't look like they're absolutely charging along right now. It looks like it's a little bit lighter on the left. Yeah, it could be. Hunter and Batten on the far side. So that's a lot of separation between these top teams. And it uh, won't take very big shift or puff for the different sides. I mean, we can see they're basically tied right now, uh, almost at maximum width apart. So Lefebvre and Fel Pelsmakers making moves on taking over the lead, or can Lambrio and Van Vogt hold them off? They've, they've got them in a loose cover, so maybe the Dutch will be able to keep the Belgians at bay. But uh, two teams that aren't really used to being up at the front of these races. Ben, you, you know these sailors better than anyone. Out, out of these two, who, who has the, the, the better form, would you say, out of the Dutch and the Belgians? Uh, up in sailing technique, you can see... Uh, the Belgians are a little closer together, so they're tucked in. Uh, actually, as we say that, the Dutch have tidied up a little bit, and you get a little bit less drag. I don't know why that crew um, on the Dutch is looking upwind. I mean, he's on, he's already on the port ley line. All you do is go fast, so he should just be concentrating on getting his windage down and, and just going as fast as he can. Um, so the, what we're seeing here is the first of the Dutch 49er sailors come through of this new group. Um, almost eight years ago, the Dutch really started focusing on FX as the training boat for them to use. And, uh, and the, we've seen it with the FX. Uh, they had lots of girls in the fleet and a few guys all training together in FX. And now we've seen some of the guys graduate into the 49er and start to do well. So uh, I would expect them to emerge, and, and we see more of them. Fisher and Graf halfway up the pack doing attack in the middle of the beat. They're in a, well, they're not halfway down. They're, they're in the top 8, 10 there. So uh, they're trying to find their way up the middle of this course. Standard of tacking, I think, is absolutely phenomenal in this fleet. Yeah, everyone's on their feet, wire to wire, every time now. It's fantastic, especially in flatter water where the skippers can really push with consistency and the boat's not going to get interrupted. Uh, it's a super fun feeling when you go wire to wire and the boat hardly slows down at all. Uh, I wish I knew that feeling. <laughs> so uh, quite a lot of conversation between Fisher and Graf and a lot to think about on this race course. It's by no means a one-way track just being crossed by Grummet and Button from Great Britain and Fisher and Graf fighting uh, the places are changing all the time as I speak around seventh or this eighth is an interesting place. view you can see both both these sailors with their heads up as opposed to out so if that crew can learn how to trapeze with his head out that'll give the skipper the ability to lay out more and they'll get a little more leverage and a little less windage so uh, trick there for all you crews learn how to balance with your head horizontal instead of vertical need a strong neck for that but, but also, surely, don't you think there's a lot to look out for? The, the wind is not steady on this race course. It's, it's pulsing. It's shifting. Surely it's, it's better to, to give up a little bit of writing moment, get your head upright, and see what's going on around the course. Yeah, so you just need to teach, your, teach yourself to do it uh, with the head horizontal there, and that also gives your skipper the ability to do the same thing. Right now, the skipper has to reach, has to look up past the crew's head. Right, right. You can see a really good uh, view of it here. So if that crew just stretches uh, straighter, um, the skipper won't have to look as far. Because you, you do have to see, obviously. I think you're being very tough on them, Ben. I've always, yeah. But um, they've, they've done a couple of really nice tacks as we've been following them up here. Up into fourth place, we have them at the moment, even up into third. So uh, good climb by Fisher and Graf, doing quite a few tacks up this beat. Meanwhile, those Phillips brothers just behind. So the Phillips brothers have made a bit of a gain up this beat as well. So it's definitely going to be the Phillips brothers that are winning the yellow group that we've been following today. A first and a, f a first and whatever they get out of this race right now. Yeah, Lambrio and Van Boigt held on to Pelsmaker there. So and, and actually gained a little bit on them as well. Yeah. We saw them on the... F on the off the start line, they they sailed a bit of a lower angle, and and where they were positioned, that would have put the Belgians under pressure. Um, 
so they managed to get out in front of them, and ho hopefully they've chosen their way line well. Well, they, and, they know uh, the, uh, the the errors of not choosing your lay line well because they managed to stick one on the Spanish last time round. They sure did, yeah. And there's no, I mean, uh, the Belgian now are just going to follow them. So uh, very comfortable sailing here, flat water. They'll be aiming at a clean bearway. I wonder if they'll, uh, they'll probably just straight set to keep things simple. You can see they're overstood, quite windy. so uh, getting that jib off a little bit so they can sail as low as they need to from the overstood position. Just about to go into the barrowway, which in some conditions can be a really tricky maneuver, but flat water shouldn't be too difficult. Yeah. They've got the vang and they're cutting them off, ready for the barrowway. Now comes the big turn down wind, straight into the hoist. Up goes the dark blue Jenica. Great technique there from the skipper comes in, so the wind shadow of the spinnaker uh, helps get that hoist up, and then you see them just delay slightly of going out in the wire because of the port tacker coming upwind. Belgium goes around Germany three in third place. Peters and Sterrett, GBR five up to fourth. Let's see how they do on this tack bear away. Obviously tricky, but they just pump off the brakes and do a slow one, but they get round, which is the main thing. They'll get that spinnaker up and get up to speed. Uh, Peters and Sterrett will try a high lane. Look, the skippers dropped the, dropped the uh, main sheet there, so they're going to have to go in and try and get that. They do it in the jibe. Skipper picks up the, the main sheet in the jibe there, but I wonder Peters and Sterrett well, would have done a, a good set. Yeah, so I think, I don't know if that was chosen or not, if they just, uh, by the time they got set, they, uh, Peters and Sterrett were up around the look. We should be able to see Peters and Sterrett uh, having a better set because they came in with speed, and I think uh, that's why these guys would have, there we can see them behind. So you can see they just push up. He still doesn't have the main cheat crews trying to get it to him, uh, and then they jibed out, but we'll see. Yeah, we've seen that side of the course do well, so it might be an okay option. McCarty and McKenzie. Leaders in the first race of the day just going round in about uh, ninth place. But at the moment, it's Lambria and Van Voet out in front on the right of our picture. The Fairburn Pels makers making life fairly easy for them because they're following them down. And we also saw the Phillips brothers up to, I think, uh, fifth there. So those two won the first two races, and we're going to see them have another good race here to, to win this fleet on the day. Well, they'll be thrilled with that. Absolutely. And the big leaderboard, who else do we see? McCarty and McKenzie down to ninth. Still can't see the Spanish in the top 15. The Spanish who were leading this race and then capsized that, that unforced error at the top. I don't think we're going to see them again today. I think they've retired. Uh, capsized, I, I'm going to bet they had a broken tiller and just decided to send it in for the rest of the day. Counting on the drop race. Yes. Only well, one more day of qualifying, three races. So it'll be critical to see if they uh, when manage does the, to sail clean tomorrow. When does the drop come in? The drop comes in after the third race. So... Uh, they'll be heading to shore today with just their first two regattas on the board, or races on the board, but of course, critically, they've got three races tomorrow, and uh, they won't have any room for error with a DNF. A lot of breeze right now. Main sheet quite Absolutely. far out. Phillips Brothers firing down the far side of the course. You can see them in the back of picture just as the leaders go into a jibe, and despite the breeze, a really, really excellent jibe by you, Netherlands. You see that little bit of safety on there. He pumped it in to help get it around, uh, take the weight off the main sheet. Out of the main sail as it came across, perfect, perfect sailing there. And um, if they've got their ley line even close to right, they'll be able to take this win. But Ten years ago, this boat handling probably would have been winning you races on a regular basis and winning you regattas. But it just seems like everyone has, has got this high speed, high pressure boat handling down to a T. Well, I say that we saw we saw a, quite a few unforced errors at the leeward mark, didn't we? Yeah, that leeward mark is. Uh, because you have to get the ley line so close and it's so hard to do with the big breeze still is a mess. Um, it also looked like the ley line or the, the marks were very close together. Uh, often uh, that can be a pretty critical element when, uh, when the breeze is up, but uh, no such problems on the finish line. Finish line will be 100 meters long and uh, they can just aim for the middle of it. And if they have to do one more drive, it usually isn't too big a deal. Boat absolutely flying along. This looks like the windiest breeze we've had all day and the boat bucking over the waves. This is still fairly flat water. Bear in mind, you go a little bit further out to sea, and it will be a lot choppier than this. Yeah, for sure. Some of these teams, if any of these teams are, are feeling like it was tougher, they'll be thrilled to be on the TV course today, which is always the one closest to shore. And uh, through the middle of the gate. One last jibe. One last jibe, and uh, no problem there. And it's going to be a race win for Ned194, Bart Lambria and Pim Van Voet from the Netherlands. Oh, they're going to be happy about that. Get that kite down, and I'm sure we're going to see a high five, some kind of celebration. And 
Second across the line, it's going to be Lefebvre and Pelsmakers from Belgium. And uh, let that kite flap just as they cross the finish line, get the kite down straight away. Fantastic finish for them. Who's going to be next across the line? The, we've been watching out for the world number ones all day. We've been expecting better things from this. And finally, it comes good for GBR5. James Peters and Finn Sterrett. That's a bit more what we expect to see from the world number ones getting a third place across the line. So we've been pretty line. critical of them, but that's still an 11-6-3 today for uh, Peters and Sterrett. So not a disaster. Uh, Tim Fisher and Fabian Graf go across and looks like they're going to finish off with a capsize. They just get away without the finish, uh, the capsize across the finish line. Now it's getting close, really, really close. We've got Japanese fighting out, but it's the Phillips who are going to cross for fifth place ahead of the Japanese, ahead of Mackenzie and McCarty from New Zealand, and followed by um, Budden and Grummet from Great Britain. And another British boat just going across. Can't quite see who that was. Hunter and Batten, maybe. I think it was Hunter and Batten went across first, actually, followed by Grummet and Budden, and then a big gap back to the rest of the fleet. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was Hunter and Batten there, so good race from them to finish up the day. That was a seventh and an eighth for those two British teams. So there to confirm the results of the top few, Lambrien van Vucht sending a fantastic race. And I can confirm uh, that the Phillips brothers have had the best race on the on the day of any fleet. So with a 115, that's uh, that's putting them at the top of the overall leaderboard, at least with the predictive. Burling and Tuke are, are having a tougher race right now, uh, back in 12th in their course. And then uh, it's a different Japanese team of Furuya and Hachimaya, who are had a 292 today on the red course, who are in third place on the overall, along with Warer, uh, Jonas Warer with uh, his young crew Jensen, also with a 2102. Uh, so that's the overall leaderboard for all three fleets coming through. Here's, uh, here's the distances and the maneuvers. So the fastest boat was the boat that won the race with an average speed of just over 12 knots. Look at Peters and Sarah up to 18 maneuvers there, and I reckon that is right because uh, we did see them going up the middle of the course. So those two obviously felt that tacking on the shifts uh, and finding the puffs downwind was critical, and obviously how much di less distance did they sail? So they didn't actually no, reduce really. too much distance, no. no. So boats still crossing the finish line in the third and final race of uh, yellow, yellow fleet um, qualifying today. And two other fleets out there, red and blue, also racing around. But uh, we were privileged enough to see the overall leaders of this regatta after day one. Um, no one will know how the, uh, the, they've done in the other fleets, uh, but the Phillips brothers can be pretty confident when they come ashore that they'll be amongst the top few. And when they see the results, they'll see that they are actually leading Kiela Voka 2019 overall. What an amazing day for them. What an amazing day of sailing. I mean, 15 to 20 knots, flat water, bunch of good skiffs. You know, race committee did an awesome job setting this course. The guys will be thrilled with the day of racing. I mean, they came here. Uh, you never know what you're going to get with a regatta, but when it starts like this, you, you knew it was worthwhile to come. Well, you always get rain, right, in Kiel, but not this year. It's California. <laughs> Just uh, catching up with a few of the back markers. Uh, at the very back there, we saw the Sillen Brothers capsized. They were the team that capsized in the middle of the gate uh, on the first lap. Uh, so they're, they're limping around the course. Good for them for not giving up, uh, just like all these teams should be uh, finishing up in the challenging conditions. Uh, but there's one team that did give up, the team that was leading that race briefly at the Windward Mark. It was the Spanish ESP 97 boat in Amara, one of the top teams here. You wouldn't be surprised if they were to win. I'm a, I'm a bit surprised they would have retired because they, they're mandated to carry an extra tiller extension. So they could have finished the race and they probably would have beaten a few of these back markers, especially the others that capsized. There's got to be and a good reason. And if there's an OCS or something tomorrow, those are points they'll have to keep. So um, maybe we'll find out why, but they didn't look injured in any sense uh, no, when we no. saw them riding the boat. So it wouldn't have been that. I, I reckon it's cockiness. It's not cockiness. They're, 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 they're not they're, they're they confident, they're heading, but they're not arrogant. They're gonna, they reckon they're heading out tomorrow with no letter scores and they're just going to take their, their lumps right now. Well, we'll see. We'll report on it. Check out the uh, report on our website to find but, out what happened. I mean, it was interesting to see how quickly that uh, lead unraveled for them going around that Wimber mark. And uh, and then when, once, one th once one thing goes wrong and you get out of your routine, it's really hard to get back into your routine again. Yeah, they were probably, what, one boat length down of the ley line. Forces two tacks. They don't do it properly, so then they end up almost fouling. They do a good job to avoid the foul, but then have a bad rounding possibly a broken tiller. We, we'll see what happened, but, uh, you know, from a first or second to a DNF, 
and one sequence at a windward mark, and it wasn't even busy for them, right? It, it was, you know, when they were up to the windward mark, it wasn't too but, much traffic, and it, you can tell how, how tough it gets. The, the moment it went wrong for them was when the, the Dutch ducked them on port, and I thought, oh, okay, so the, you, you just said um, we saw the best of the right and the best of the left coming together with just a duck in it. Well, that duck and, and the close tack afterwards proved to be the undoing of the Spanish because the Dutch were holding the Spanish on. The, the Spanish had nowhere to tack out to, and uh, suddenly it, it all went wrong, and they, they, uh, they looked like sitting ducks suddenly, didn't they? Yeah, the uh, the choice there, of course, is they wanted to get, they wanted the lead, right? So they held their starboard advantage. Hey, if they had tacked underneath and given up uh, and done their two tacks earlier, you know, we'd be saying a different story, probably about the overall story of the day. Uh, but as it was, that choice uh, got made, and they couldn't quite pull it off. And uh, you know, not a disaster, but possibility of disaster if they don't dro end up dropping it. Yeah, yeah, those things, those kind of moments could ba uh, come back to haunt them. Um, the, the Phillips brothers, they really are the, the standout performers of the day, and uh, surely we, we've got to be looking at them as seriously hot prospects to, to go to an Olympic Games for Australia, the way they've been sailing this year. It's a, well, it's a very long year. They do have the test event spot, so uh, we'll see them at the test event. Um, here we go, the overall leaderboard with drops in. Well done uh, to our team here in the studio, but uh, we can see f uh, a new number two as the races uh, on the other courses are still unfolding, but Ruel and Amaros, uh, French team, French squad, very strong right now uh, with a 172 in their fleet. And uh, then Burling and Took uh, finished with an 11 there in the final race, uh, so relying on the three and the one. So they never finish outside the top 10. I don't think they finished outside the top 10 once d during the whole of, what, 19, 20 races that we had at the Weymouth European Championship. And already on day one, they finished outside of the top 10, which, remember, you multiply that by three, that's the 33rd place that Burling and Took got. And then, you know, I want to talk a little bit about Lambrio van Voigt, or however you say his last name, but um, 471, I mean, that's really fantastic sailing. They're a young team, and they don't have an Olympics berth yet, Netherlands, uh, but they do have a couple teams that are pushing really hard, and, uh, you know, a day like this, that'll give them a lot of confidence. It was a, it was a tough day out there with a, lot of good, with, with a lot of good teams. And the Dutch really coming on strong generally, and, and, and one of the things that you mentioned earlier was that they don't always know who they're going to be sailing with. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that another time as we look to, from 12th to 22nd down there. Peters and Sterrett in 14th. So they started out the day badly with the 11th. They've recovered with a good recovery in race 6 and another good climb in uh, race three to come third in and that race. And then we've got the three Germans in a row. All the, we, I mean, these three should all be challenging for the title there. That was uh, the, the three Germans there. I also saw Harry Mel just the fourth there having a great regatta. Uh, he's in one of the young American teams, and there's a bunch of young American teams all pushing. You know, those guys will actually be looking all the way to 2028, possibly with the home games. So, you know, obviously trying to get into 2020, it's a totally inexperienced team. So probably about half a dozen American teams trying to get in for 2028. Um, uh, and, and then look to you know be contenders by 20 sorry by 2028 okay so we hope you enjoyed that first day of racing we followed the 49ers tomorrow um ben what do we have in store tomorrow we've got all the uh, the olympic classes here but what are we going to be focusing on tomorrow the live coverage will be of the 49er fx we'll post uh, on the website 49er.org the countdown to it so you can get the exact start time as they release that uh, but it'll be 49er fx tomorrow nacra 17 the day after and then back to 49er for gold fleet on day four followed by the medal races on day five it's all being lined up for you isn't it the, the class manager of those three fleets that you've just mentioned uh, so that they're, they're all your babies that we're going to be talking about fantastic isn't it? it it is fantastic i've sort of got to agree with you ben um that was one of the best days sailing you will ever see and we saw it at kiel of Oka, the 125th edition and out of those 125 editions i don't think we've ever seen such great sailing conditions we we're enjoying california we hope you are we will see you back here tomorrow
Thank you.